Welcome straight off the bat to Ronan Agari. Good morning to you. Morning, how are you? Good, how are you getting on? Good, thank you. Yeah, the sun is shining, so um, it's been a while coming, so good weather hopefully, um, even though it's meant to be raining in Montpellier tomorrow, but um, uh, things are good. Yeah, exciting time of year, obviously, so the games keep coming and um, we need a point out of tomorrow's game, a uh, point minimum, obviously, uh, to get a guaranteed home semi-final for, uh, it's not home semi-final, to go straight to a semi-final for, for the top 14. So, um, loads loads at stake and exciting times. And you've been saying for ages that's exactly where you need to be at this point of the season to get that uh, week's breather. And just a point needed, is that, uh, I'm sure I know your answer to this, but in terms of your approach to the game and the general mindset, it's a very different approach from that, as you've well described previously, about that constant beat of needing to win, 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 week in, week out. Yeah, yeah, well, it just becomes a different, I suppose, um, set of circumstances late in the game in the fact where normally uh, you go for a win, but you need to think bigger picture in this regard. We're 10 points clear of Stade Francais. We play them in the last game, so we have a lot in our favour. Uh, they need two, five points to catch us. Um, so, uh, both in terms of, I suppose, the immediate future, um, I mean, if you're, whatever, eight points down tomorrow, um, kicking a, a penalty is hugely important. So in, in France, the system works where it's five points or less. You get a, bo a bonus defensive, which means a, a, a bonus point for finishing within five of your opponents. Can the can the weather forecast drastically change your tactical plans, Ronald? Like, say, for example, it's given certain weather and then very, very late in the day, a couple of days before the match or a day before the match, you realise, ah, it's actually going to piss down here. So do you have to change things uh, at all? Yeah, you would. You would have to. It's 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 the one sport I'm convinced that it has a huge impact on the game. The weather, you know, I think uh, for the amount of handling that's involved, it's obviously so much easier to handle a dry ball. Um, so, no matter how skilled you are, there's still an extra um, component of concentration and time required to catch pass. At ease when it's lashing out of the heavens and there's a and there's wind involved with it too. Obviously, uh, I mean a wet ball is unpleasant compared to a dry ball, and it becomes um, more advantageous for uh, for the defensive, I suppose, points in the game. We had uh, James Tracy in studio last week, Ronan, uh, just after the Heineken Cup semi-finals, and uh, it, obviously the conversation turned to your own uh, victory and his thoughts on the La Rochelle setup ahead of the Leinster game. Uh, we have a short clip here. I think you've seen the longer clip, but here's the short clip for people who haven't seen it. The last few La Rochelle games, like they really pushed the boundaries on um, the breakdown. Okay, so how are we going to stop Leinster? at source breakdown is, is seems to be kind of the narrative of how of what how they go about it so you know we we are kind of dependent a lot on, on having uh, good officials because if they get away with kind of not holding their body weight and just killing the ball there's not much you can do really and and, and it's very frustrating when yes they give clean purchase on the ball but a lot of times they're not on their feet and they just get rewarded for time after time. And they might get pinged once or twice, but then the momentum swings and they're getting rewarded for it and, and Given how uh, recent he was in that Leinster dressing room, it might be a good insight to the way they're thinking. What are your, uh, what's your reaction to that? Are your thoughts on it? Uh, yeah, well, that's interesting. I've never heard that. Um, and is James Tracy um, part of the Leinster setup? No, or is he retired okay. in the last year and yeah, fully detached. In the last, okay, he retired in the in the last year. Okay, I thought he retired in through in the year, no. Mm, possibly w was certainly within the last year anyway yeah within this season so December I think part, yeah part of their setup is yeah. there if they're a family and they they are if a guy gets injured obviously he remains part of your setup till the end of that season and then he will be presented with something yeah so it's interesting it Give, gives me straight from the team meeting to uh, off the ball <laughs> <laughs> potentially uh, it's, it's, it's possible well, yeah, well, exactly. I'm just wondering, is it a plant on Leinster's behalf or is this James Tracy as a new guy setting out on a, on a new career? Um, that's, I suppose, the first thing that strikes me because um, uh, in terms of, yeah, the breakdown, he is, 
he has an opinion on that but stopping Leinster but we could also I suppose turn it as like um, you know how do you stop Leinster but how do you stop La Rochelle you know it depends how you frame the question what you want out of it how you see it you know so uh, it will become uh, obviously uh, a little bit spicy in the build up to the game uh, certain camps put a huge emphasis on uh, work behind the scenes with referees um, but I think my 10 years has taught me to try and control things we can control put your energy into that and uh, the better team will win on the day um, his his point about the um, so the, to summarise basically what he's talking about is La Rochelle um, pushing the boundaries at the breakdown he was talking about not holding on to um, players not holding on to their own body weight he said uh, pinged once or twice but get away a lot with it and he went into detail about the hooker which would have been his own position uh, breaking the 15 into open play before the line out was technically over in whatever regard that it you know whatever circumstance that would have been that that there's a pushing of the boundaries I suppose would be the overall point. yeah yeah all good teams push the boundaries there's no doubt about that but I think what's different between the guys he would have trained with in the past and the guys that are in my camp would be I suppose the physical power so you know what I mean the first thing is that uh, it's not easy to yeah. To win collisions with or without the ball when you run into a Bugarit and Aldra de Botti and Antonio Skelton. So, uh, footwork from the ball carrier needs to be very important and they need to be very good at that. Otherwise, it becomes a mismatch because the more dominant uh, player wins. Mm. So, that'll be something we'll be, we'll be looking at and something we've been good at no matter who's wrestling. So, yeah. I think what good sides, great sides do is they. They put their energy into them, into themselves. There's everyone has a different viewpoint on it, and it's easy to go whinge to the referee and say that they're not controlling their body weight and um, stuff like that. So, um, yeah, that's an interesting clip. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'll take that for the compliment in which uh, spirit in which it was delivered. Um, the the point about pushing the boundaries is used as a sort of a euphemism, right, for like bending the rules slightly. And actually, when I saw the James Tracy clip last week or the interview last week, the thing that jumped out for me was like that we'd been lauding the All Blacks for that type of thing for years. So like one team's infringement is another team's um, eking out a, a benefit within the game. What is there like that sort of stuff that he's talking about? Is that does that sound alien to you? You like I don't know what he's talking about. Is that the sort of stuff that just crops up in the middle of games? Is that the sort of stuff that you can? Over sort here, of... I'm removed from the chit chat in the pubs and in the shops and on the street and mm. in, in in Dublin or and it's surrounding counties and provinces that uh, watch and support Leinster. What's undeniable is that Leinster are very, very good. Uh, but a lot of teams have let them be very good, so mm. the plan will be to um, play as much ball as we can and then, um, as I said earlier, let the better team win. They're, they have been um, very, very impressive and we're playing them obviously in the Aviva, which makes it more daunting but way more exciting because um, the, I suppose the consequences of, of hitting top form and producing a season's best performance for us, which we will need, uh, brings its own reward. So, you know, I just see the the privilege, the joy uh, in preparing a team to to try and win a European Cup final. For me, it excites me hugely. There'll be subplots, there'll be energy put in all or into different things, but it's going to come down to who can execute on the day. Yeah, and this one is obviously a bit like you're alluding to a subplot and an interesting talking point and... Um, can become a subcontext or a lead into the game or whatever, um, but equally, like the the that ability to sort of people again, there's a lot, an awful lot of euph euphemisms that are room, uh, used around it, like playing the ref or whatever it might be. Is that the sort of stuff that you can um, practice for or be good at? Like, and I'm not talking about because every, every every you've said it already, every good team is doing that. Like, you're not at the races if you're not looking at ways to get a benefit um, over your opponent yeah, or to work with the referee you're playing with. The strengths are very um, different in both teams, and the fact that you know you look at Farlong Porter, Sheehan, Ryan, Doris, Conan, um, Van der Fleer, 
brilliant, brilliant rugby players, but very different to Antonio Bugaret, Wardy, Skelton, Batia, Aldridge, you know. So, in what, what sense? Trying to do, just different profiles of player. Um, yeah. In the fact that, um, you know, different capacity to do things, different capacity, how, how they play the game. So, as a coach, Leinster would be trying to set their guys up to to get moments where they're very comfortable playing their game while well, I'd be setting up my team to try and uh, get us to do what we're good at and that's uh, playing with the ball, you know. So, um, I mean, it depends on, on on how you see it and what approach you're have ta- you you're going to take to it. But, um, I mean, there's undoubted quality on, uh, on both sides uh, but you're, you're hoping like we did in the Exeter game and like Leinster did in the, in the Toulouse game, that it's the, the winner was clear and evident for everyone. A lot of finals sometimes become tight, but I think what you have with these two teams is that you, the, the, two, the teams are going to fire shots and one team will break and, and uh, the other team will go on, obviously, and win it. It's the dark arts, essentially, Ronan, isn't it? What James Tracy is talking about there, for all intents and purposes, and and it's not a, it's not something that's exclusive to rugby. You get the dark arts. We spoke about it plenty of times in the show about Gaelic games and uh, soccer as well, and plenty of other other sports. But it's it's one of those aspects of rugby that it's not like one team does it more than another, or is it? Dark arts is a different subject. I think there are definitely players who are good at dark arts in terms of blocking and uh escorting back and kick chase what uh we're talking about here is is your skill set mm. is there's nothing to do with dark arts for me if you're a very good chop tackler and you're very good at poaching ball which um a lot of la rochelle players are you get rewarded if you're inaccurate at poaching ball and sloppy in your technique you get punished it's very very simple there's no dark arts in the ball there's a lot of skills the same as a kicker kicking goal, goals there are a lot of good goal kickers. There are a lot of goal kickers that crumble under pressure. There are a lot of players that can lose that position um, in a post position because they don't have the strength to keep that position, while uh, the guys that are uh, able to do that and work on their technique and understand the rules and understand uh, the laws of the game, they get rewarded. So, um, And there's a few freaks playing um, because Batia... Anyone who has played against them and Leinster players have said it to me in the past, they are uh, incredibly impressed by by this guy. And anyone who referees him says exactly the same thing after the game. So uh, they're special players on both sides. And we've got to remember that it's um, a spectacle that um, needs to highlight, I suppose, the strengths of both teams. You probably get used to these uh, media narratives and, as you say, uh, interviews that uh, crop up. Um, you know, in the weeks before a big match, especially that the week ten days before a massive match like this, interviews are done on both sides, and you know whether people will admit it or not, or not they're, you know the the effort is there to, I guess, get some sort of advantage. But that's that's professional sport, isn't it? I I, I suppose in your position, you get used to that over t- over time. Um, yeah, especially because you're in the staff now, or you're the manager of the team, or as we say in France, which is the head coach in in Irish lingo. Uh, but um, it becomes nearly uh, this. Yeah, it's a game that sometimes has no influence on the game because there's 23 guys who would put on their socks and shorts and jersey and game day, and are they in control of their emotions or not? Are they in a good place? And where um, have they got in their headspace to perform? You know, so all this thing is is talk before the game, but sure, 80 minutes there'll be kick off for either us or for them, and then it'll be just. Um, it'll be full on and if you're able to adapt if you're able to think straight if you're able to uh, execute your plan uh, that for me is the interesting thing the build up is is a little bit uh, obviously for uh, fans and supporters the important thing is to not say too much (laughs) say which too much like in, for for your position, the important thing is to not. You don't want to say anything that I'm. I'm not certainly talking about stuff that gets put up in the dressing room wall or whatever. But like, no, I don't. I don't. I don't think uh, you have to take that into account too. If they want to put stuff up in the wall, it's a reflection on them. Yeah, you know? but I mean, you don't want to be saying anything that's 
um, you have to do, are, are suppose if I slightly reword it, are you what do you watch your uh, words a little bit more in the lead into a game like that? I think you watch your words all the time. You've got to be very not watch your words, but you've got to be very conscious of what you're saying is accurate and honest. Mm. Because I've worked under coaches in the past where they haven't been honest and they were picked apart by players because they were told this and that, and there's no consistency in their behaviour. What players I think maybe don't like, but they respect as if they're getting clear messages and consistent messaging. And um, it makes for, for stronger relationships. Stronger relationships obviously mean for a stronger group. So, um, you know, I think it's a, um, a fantastic opportunity for, for my club to go to Dublin uh, to contest a European Cup final. It doesn't get any juicier. It doesn't get any better. And the excitement involved in that um, is will be the dominant, I suppose, sentiment going going towards kickoff time. How much uh, prep have you done for that already? Um, very little, to be fair. Uh, oh, sorry, well, for the for the for the Leinster game, but you're you're investing in your team all year round. You know, the goal is to get better every Saturday, and my players will be fully aware of that message coming from me. Uh, so. Um, it may sound surprising, but we would put so much of the energy which you need to be into controlling uh, our performance because, I mean, how many knock-ons do we make in the game? How many missed tackles do we make? How many kick-off receptions do we drop? That has nothing to do with Leinster. It's got to do with our skill set. So mm. we need to make sure that we're strong at our fundamentals. And uh, it's the same as any other week where the focus will be on us because... The beauty of coaching here is I feel that if we get ourselves right, we can beat anyone. Are you, by the same token, like are you on the Monday morning after the semi-finals turn around to turn a go or the rest of your coaching staff and saying, right, find me the place where we can target them? Um, yeah, we'd uh, obviously, uh, that is important, uh, but it's... It's another 5%, but if you're looking at that to be the be-all and, and end-all, uh, Adrian, you're missing. I think when you become consistently good as a team, and no matter what sport it is, you're continuously building on your basics, on your basic, and you're adding a layer, and you're adding a layer. What you can't do is explode on a big occasion. That would be mean that your, I suppose, your values or your basics aren't strong enough to contest a final against a brilliant team like Leinster. So uh, I think, you know, I've, um, the way, you know, I mean, uh, Leo came on, Guy used to be came into the dressing room after last year's final, really, really classy. They were hurting. That could well be me Saturday week. That's what happens in sport. But I would be so... Uh, annoyed or disappointed if if I was watching a European Cup final on TV. You know, this is this is where every coach in Europe wants to be. This is where you test yourself for and it's it's an incredibly great opportunity. It probably depends on, on the size of a coaching staff as well, but do you have the the, the ability, I guess, Ronan, after you beat Exeter in the semi final to, to set aside some staff to concentrate solely on Leinster or is it everyone is, is obviously focusing on Montpellier and these other games first? No, because Leinster are very smart, you know. It's not as if you look at a, a t footage of them for an hour and you go, oh, yeah, I have them here. You know, the, the detail is of where you can find opportunity against a team like that is very, very small. Mm -hmm. Every team has weaknesses. They'll pick out areas, they'll go after us. We think we can find a few uh, chinks with them. But, like, you're dreaming to kind of go, well, I have five players here, we're going to score five tries from, you know. It doesn't work like that. It's it's about trying to put them under pressure uh, by, uh, I suppose, keeping hold of the ball and trying to be um, picking good decisions in the heat of battle. Um, there's obviously the opportunity to see uh, Leinster in the heat of battle. Maybe their team is, doesn't bear a huge resemblance to the team they're going to play in the um, Champions Cup final, so maybe there won't be a huge amount in it. But we've been joined, obviously, um, by your good friend in studio here as well in the meantime. Uh, Alan Quinlan's here. Um, and we're going to talk to him in a little bit more detail about the Munster-Leinster game. What's your expectation about, or any thoughts to it at all, about the um, Munster-Leinster game at the Aviva tomorrow? 
In my opinion, is it? Yeah. Um, I like some monster. Uh, well, I've got um, four, I suppose, high-profile injuries at the weekend, which um, weakens their hand because there's no matter who you're talking about, when quality comes out, there are certain players that are very, very difficult to replace. Uh, I haven't seen teams on either side, and uh, it has a big impact on what... Um, I suppose result or performance you would expect depending on who is who is playing. Um, aside from the injuries, Munster will be pretty loaded. Um, but what Leinster have, of course, to any other team is that they have. Um, you mean thirty players, forty players who can go in and um, keep that performance level at a really, really high um, level. So they're in the Aviva. They will be. Um, had favourites to, to beat Munster again. Um, but you need to see team sheets to give you an accurate call on it. Yeah, we won't know that for a little bit. Uh, interesting, as always. He didn't bite anyway. <laughs> Fair play to your kids, you didn't bite. <laughs> uh, no, it's, 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 it's a tough one. Um, I think being respectful to James Tracy, like he, this is stuff that he's opinion as he's seen and you know, if I was talking about Munster, I'd be probably trying to highlight, and I've probably done it in commentary myself when they play the opposition. Classic example of that was last year. Went to New Zealand, first test, Ireland played the All Blacks. Um, Ireland played the All Blacks, and uh, they have problems around the breakdown. They highlighted next week. I was kind of vocal in some of the stuff, even on Off the Ball or in, in interviews afterwards, and... Uh, it changes the following week. So this stuff can make a little bit of a difference. I think Jaco Piper is a very good referee. And I, I think both, and obviously, Rod, you don't, you don't need to comment on this, but both coaches will have things that they see. Um, and that's just the way the modern game goes. And us as pundits or ex-players, we kind of will say s some things. Um, I don't think he's... I think it's probably coming from James as well that, being in that dressing room and this stuff has been highlighted and, and it shows the level of detail that mm. a team like Leinster go to um, and it gets ingrained in you as well and you, you even if I talk to a coach for an, from any team you know they might say something to me and I and it goes into my head and, and it's something God I didn't really notice that um, James obviously that's his opinion as well and but both sides, and this is you know the kind of mind games of, of such a big game, will look to chat to the referees, and it does happen a lot. And you've got to be squeaky clean. And, and I think Roger will know this, Leo will know this. Discipline is going to be really important, you know, and getting that stuff right. Even for example, last week, you know, Leinster, Glasgow, or Munster, Glasgow over in Glasgow, Andrea P Piardi, the referee. Um, Entry entry points there for for um, for both teams. He penalised both sides. Yeah. So this kind of coming in from the side, and and he was really sticky on that. So you need to communicate with the referee. And there I say it, probably the dark arts. Um, I couldn't criticise anyone for stealing a yard or two here in in, in matches because uh, <laughs> I probably half the time I didn't know I was offside, and Fair, uh, referees were kind of coaching me and saying like, "Come on." Um, You're making fair, this one a bit obvious. It's a fair observation. James has been very good, by the way. He's been really absolutely good, uh, no, no, and uh, it's not uh, even a uh, criticism of the game. I know that, but I, I felt actually just important. The general, uh, I, I don't know where the the uh, it's been alluded to, obviously, about where the uh, tone of the comments has come from. But he's been very good, Ronan. You've been way over time, so um, good luck. We'll talk to Have you again. Nice Cheers, Ronan Garrett on the line there. Um, no, didn't thank I you for going back into it there, by the way. But uh, no, I don't think there's um, there's any. Um, obviously, it's, it's, James is very articulate and very, very intelligent very good rugby and really man. You know like, what I mean? Um, so there's uh, not a huge analyst of the game. I know that, but I I felt it was a good important thing to say. Um, the the uh, that point about the like uh, infringements, like uh, all, every good team is at that. Absolutely, and Leinster are at it, La Rochelle are at it. Um, for years we said Ireland and the All Blacks it. amazing. Look at look at how they can play yeah. the referee and like I, even as opponents you'd be lauding them for like how they played the referee. It even some teams you play uh, Sean Edwards for years. How much um, you look at the t his teams, the line speed, the defence, and honestly, I've commentated on those games at times, and you think they're half a yard offside, but like there's six of them together in a line and they're coming off so quickly. Nobody's shooting out of the line, and it's yeah. so difficult for referees. They need a lot more assistance from 
um, the assistant referees to pick up stuff. And if it's an individual shooting out, it looks very obvious. The crowd go, they start cheering and referee goes, hand out, he's offside. Um, of course you push the boundaries. And we did look at the All Blacks a lot. And it was mentioned when I played with Munster and uh, with Ireland in, in earlier years, things they were doing when you analyse the opposition, the way they could you know, block people out, um, you know, escort runners going back, subtly stopping someone from, from making a challenge in the air, all that kind of stuff. Joe Schmidt seems really good at it, weren't they, for, for Ireland? And, you know, I, I wouldn't have looked at it as been... You look at it as being really shrewd and Huge. exploiting oh, yeah, a little we're, space we're that got a fella foot. standing here with his hands and up like that. And is he actually blocking someone or is he just standing in the way of someone? Do you know what I mean? And uh, that's... That happens a lot and it's very difficult for referees and there's a lot of problems at the breakdown still, in my opinion, yeah. as regards uh, entry points. And there is our own player safety and um, you know protecting players. I made this point um, to someone after the game the other day. Once had four HIAs in that game, mm -hmm. 10, 15 years ago, those four players would have played on. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, it, it in some ways it caused a concern that four players in one game but honestly, that would have happened and they would have played on yeah. before. So player safety is very important and a big part of that is the breakdown. So um, it's, it's it still right needs to be policed very that well. That well, yeah, yeah. The, the two uh, URC semis, so we'll uh, reverse back into the Stormers' conduct uh, tomorrow at 3 o'clock in a minute, but uh, we'll continue with Leinster Munster for the minute tomorrow at the Aviva at half past five. Bernard Jackman during the week, uh, I saw saying that um, with the injuries to Munster, it's a freebie for them. You can look at it that way, and yeah, I was talking to Jaron uh, Monday about this, and and even on the podcast this week. Like, um, are you in this this bonus, bonus territory? You know, and they are, aren't they? Realistically, like <laughs> as long as they don't get it depends what way you look at that as a player yourself. Because if you feel if it can take away some pressure, it can enable a higher level of performance in a sense that you nearly you're not restricted and tense and mm -hmm. tight, and you nearly try something. And if one of these things come off, then you go, Jesus. This is great. We're in the flow. We're in the buzz. Mm. But if you allow it to kind of go, oh, do I want to get back up as quick? Obviously, you're not consciously making a decision like mm. that. But out of desperation, sometimes pressure can bring a level of performance yeah. in all sports. You know, how often does the underdog shock the big team yeah. in a final? It, it can happen. Can happen yeah. um, the FA Cup for years was the great, mm. a great barometer for that. But so I think. I think Munster will feel that um, they've got to have desperation here and of course afterwards and people outside of the, the group will think, yeah, they went to South Africa and salvaged their season, they qualified for Europe, they finished fifth, um, three great away results which you can build on, mm. um, showed real steel, determination, a level of resilience that's required going forward, I think. Um, compared to a very poor start to the season where they lost five of the first seven games and even one of those wins early on against Zebra was no bonus point down in Cork. It cost them a point. Could have been costly in the end, but it wasn't. Um, after Glasgow, it was like this panic. God, the season could really peter out. They've just lost. They're in danger of not making Europe or the playoffs and what they did in South Africa. And even going to, to, to Glasgow last week and fronting up from a physical point of view, Glasgow haven't been beaten there all season. The Stormers hadn't been beaten in 21 games mm -hmm. at home. So there are things that you can say, right, there's something there that we can build on. So they finish, they finish strong. Will they kind of go, well, Leinster, the narrative is Leinster, no matter who they pick, will still win. It's in Dublin, they're too good. We've the injuries. If you buy into all that stuff, your goose. You need people in the dressing room this week going, this isn't bonus territory for us. This is... Who are those people? A Sp URC. Specifically, who are well, those people in the Munster dressing room? You need room? leaders. Who you, are they? I don't know because I'm not in that dressing room, but obviously Peter O'Mahony is a great leader for the team and he showed brilliant leadership and fight and dog in the last few in weeks. Is out this weekend? As they don't know about. still. Um, they were giving him every chance. Um... Conor Murray has been superb for Munster and I think he's I've said this before um, getting dropped by out of the Munster 23 for Northampton in the European game is a big kind of big, it's big news like mm, yeah. for a guy at, at his level his response has been superb and he's an example for anyone dropped in any, in any sport he, 
all the stuff came out that week of him patting fellas on the back, encouraging people, being an unbelievably positive influence. It's difficult to kind of put your disappointment to one side, but that's how you respond, that's how you get back, and that's how you earn respect for people and, and become a real leader. Um, so, yeah, they need everyone right across the board talking it up and saying, look, there's an opportunity here. It's a very hard challenge. Um, and for any team playing Leinster, no matter what team they play, they're at a level now that's really, they're so diligent in everything they do, their skill set, their tempo, their pace, their accuracy, all that kind of stuff. And they don't panic. They're a very strong, powerful, resilient team themselves. Um, so it's going to be a very difficult situation for, for Munster. But they've got to believe that they need to bring a brilliant performance here and, and take their opportunities. And I think Graham Rounty did say it, and it is obvious there are certain things they could have been a lot better at last week. They could have made it more comfortable for themselves um, around taking opportunities. But if they get a chance or two tomorrow, I think it's really... To, get, to have any chance, they've got to... I think if they get a good start in the game and score, score some points early on, again, it's kind of obvious. Those those injuries that we mentioned, Murray, Snyman, uh, Nash, Fekatoa, uh, we're not sure, obviously, on O'Mahony or Jamie Barron, I think, might still yeah, be a doubt as well. There's about six. Can that, it's hard to swing a positive from, from those injuries, but can there be an impact of players who will start a massive URC semi-final tomorrow that otherwise, if all those players were fit, wouldn't have? So if it, if for them, I guess, it's a free hit. Yeah, it is in a sense, but it's, it kind of, um, if they had the team that last week and probably the bench, you're saying, God, this this is probably the strongest forward pack, certainly, that they could, you know, close to the strongest um, forward pack that they could have available to themselves and and the impact off the bench, very important as well. So it does give opportunities, I think. I just think for any neutral, any Munster fan or neutral would like to see RG Snyman out in the field, given his story and all, you know what I mean? It's, oh, yeah. it's just been uh, unbelievably disappointing for him and, and lucky for him but I think he's never got a kind of a crack at Leinster and you just kind of think from a Munster point of view he played that game a couple of years ago where he was lifting the line out four, five, ten minutes was it? I, don't, I can't remember He was. it was very early in that game gone mm-hmm. so um, he would have been really important to him but um, there is opportunity for other players but you know it's it's highly unlikely that they, they will get a result, but I think they have a great opportunity to continue the, the, the fight and determination, um, add a, adding a little bit of skill and, and, and opportunity taking, taking their opportunities tomorrow. Um, Leinster won't give them too many, but if they get one or two... And being disciplined, Quinny, like Leinster's record very important, of, yeah. of like putting teams away when they pick up yellow cards or whatever is and just it's not panicking really when they're piling on the pressure in the attack zone of the 22 that you're the referees and going like uh, offside 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 that gives Leinster a real chance to play and then if they you know if they don't score off that they're doing the tap and go penalty there was two of them down in Limerick you know in the game at Christmas where Munster uh, after half time Leinster have a sin binning uh, they score a penalty try what a boost. They go ahead in the game at Thoman Park. Leinster are a little bit weakened as regards selection. You think kick on here and they're gonna they're gonna get a, a long awaited win in the league against Leinster, but you know, in that ten minute period they go up the field, score two tries and uh, see out the game by a point. Shows how good they are and that they don't panic. So uh, very difficult task for Munster. But again it's an exciting one if you're a player and you go, right, if you can build on that bonus territory thing, say right People don't expect us to win here. We do have a bit of a less pressurised situation. Build up a load of pressure that there's an expectation and there's a standard that you're trying to set as a group to say that we have to make sure we're on it here. But, look, the worst thing that can happen Munster here is, and I don't think it will happen, is what happened last May, June. Remember, the, 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 the season went on later last year where it was a strong Munster team available to them and a very weakened Leinster team and they lost 35-25 in that game. Yeah, That was a real kind of well, low point for them. So um, Leinster could go full tilt here. I don't think 
team wise they will but yeah, they'll, they'll like, still be very on, strong on and they'll probably have the bench loaded because Leo and, and just in case the they'll worst, see like, there's yeah. a little bit of um, momentum here with Munster as on well on that it's a shame that like the injuries you can't account for because they can crop up at any no. point of the season and it's just disappointing that there isn't like you'd love to have seen the two of them going full bore at it with nothing other than let's say in the immediate uh, uh, future the uh, URC final like the scheduling and I think it comes up year in year out but could they not just pull it two weeks forward to leave let's say URC final possibly yeah Gap it's hard it's just Champions very hard Cup to final. find them yeah. just, just to give themselves when the they're back to back having, like when you because like it's, it's it feels a bit like after the Lord Mayor show now tomorrow whereas it should be the biggest event in town but like we're talking about Leinster holding back some of their players even from a crowd, po- crowd point of view I think it'll it'll have an effect Leinster have been you know so many big games over a number of weeks um, it's maybe there's you know I think there'll be a decent crowd there but yeah. like this fixture as you say a league semi-final the place pr- should Just probably be full tomorrow. Should be. It should there's be. There's so many games on. It's very difficult yeah. one, Adrian. You, they, they, I, they, just, they, they have to make a cold decision at some point. We're going to pull it back. We're played in April back. and played well, bring know, it back keep just, them a couple just of weeks. weeks yeah, it's like hard that. because you've semi finals and of both competitions and stuff going on. It's, it's really could, difficult. I think if they put their minds to it, it's not the hardest nut. It's, to it's crack. a difficult one, but um, it, it's. Monster have won two and twelve. Like, bad and record at the Aviva return. as well. One of them is the, uh, the Rainbow Cup. So you go back to 2018-19, the last time they beat them in the league. So and a bad uh, record at the Aviva, not only against Leinster, they just yeah, don't have a good time there. Yeah, they don't. So um, yeah, maybe they'll. So it's all set for a Monster win. Is kind of what we're saying here. This is this is the day they draw the line. Ah, yeah, Monsters to lose. Yeah, yeah, Monster. Yeah, it's yeah, good yeah, good ob- I agree with yeah. you. Yeah. It's a good opportunity for for Simon Zebel. I mean, when you see Nash out of the team, Earl's out for the season. Obviously, He's not available, Shane. I don't think he is available. Another I think one. he's still injured, you know. There's, there's talk that he might be available. Well, there's talk that, well, Munster are very depleted in that area, yeah, aside yeah. from the f- six injuries last week. Conway as well. Conway isn't there. Liam yeah. Coombs is out as well. And Keith Earls, mm. you know, maybe a, a possibility. I don't know, but like they have a lot of injuries. And the depth that Leinster have is couple of years ahead of yeah. every other team and it'll probably stay as strong it'll be it's just hard to kind of chase that level of quality and depth and they deserve massive credit you know what I mean for for that but um, if you're Leo Cullen how strong a team are you putting out considering the game next weekend I think he'll be cautious of of that bit of momentum Munster have had in the last few weeks they'll be pretty battle hardened determined um, so I think he'll, of course, he'll respect the fixture and and not want to repeat what happened last year with the Bulls. Um, they'll want to win both competitions. Mm. I think they're that good to do that. Um, they have the quality in players and the depth in players to do that. So um, I still I think they'll probably mix mix it up a little bit and and there'll definitely be a bit of, of a, a safety net on the bench yeah. as regards <laughs> the power and quality if they need it. I'm not going to ask a prediction because I think that the natural conclusion to the conversation is leading one direction. It's not to say that will happen, but that's I think it, any prediction. Unless Munster bring a nine out of ten performance and Leinster are off it a little yeah. bit, but that's probably the same. We're kind of saying look, people are looking at the La Rochelle Leinster game the week after, given. What we've seen from Leinster this season, that isn't given talking rubbish and talking them up for the sake of it. Logic says Leinster will win. That's the, yeah. yeah. The, in the other game, um, Logic probably says the Stormers are going to win and uh, Connacht obviously have managed to beat a couple of South African teams this season, both of them um, at home, but the Ulster game will give them a lot of confidence. They are this absolutely the sort of team and listen to them during the week who will go out there with absolutely believing that they can win that game. Yeah, and again, it's, it's kind of the mentality of going, well, we... Ex- People expect us to... They're definitely um, in a situation from where they were six, eight weeks ago. The run was brilliant. Yeah. And to get into Europe and to be in the knockout stage and be in the semi-final now, and I mean that very respectfully, like they beat Munster up in, at the start of the season and were brilliant mm. against them. Munster beat them down Thoman Park. Both of them have had their struggles, particularly at the start of the season. Like Connacht's was a dreadful start when you think of, and it was down to that 4G pitch that they ended up scheduling, so basically scheduling games away to start. They were away to Ulster and then they had to go to South Africa. So first three games, no no wins. Um, it was a very difficult start for them. So um, they've been brilliant, and you know they were brilliant and, and, and very and deserving yeah. winners last week against Ulster. Yeah. And I think they're the t- kind of side that. 
in a sense they they play a little bit and use that bonus territory stuff and they've done it before where uh, a little bit of a chip on the shoulder and uh, which is 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 needed and if you use it in the right way and uh but they have brilliant determination last week they were superb up in belfast they have, they they were up for the fight and that you have to be up for the fight and i think they've a real chance here does they could really cause problems for the stormers they've got to deliver up front as a pack of forwards and the, and the forwards that come off the bench because they are very powerful scrum line out mall all that kind of stuff but and i'm sure they look at Munster a few weeks ago if you hold on to the ball for a period of time you can you can you can ask questions so they've got to be accurate and again they need that kind of eight or nine out of ten pot most definitely to to get a result there but um they need their big players to step up and leadership is a really important part of it and again it's it's there's similarities as regards you know if players kind of are jovial about it and relaxed yes um that can help but they've got to have a little and bit of fire have as well his class and like carty on pl- carty playing well in his day like yeah. you say the leadership the experience there's like it's not a stretch the, in the way that we 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 assume the other game is a stretch a lot of things have to go right for the, Munster the, the concern when you play in the South Africans is the physicality yeah. and the size and the power and stuff like that um, but if they get a good set piece um, Connacht yeah. and they're very hard side to get the ball back off and um, I think they, they butchered a few chances against Ulster they, last they were, week so yeah. if they're a bit more accurate and take their chances they have a real real chance but it's a similar kind of scenario in both games that you know the obvious favourites are the Stormers and Leinster, and, and and unless the other two teams, Connacht and Munster, bring something special for a consistent level, which they're, you couldn't doubt, you wouldn't doubt them completely that they can't do something like that because both sides have a feel good factor, a confidence about them. Um, I think Munster were obviously Connacht can pick the same twenty three from last week that mm-hmm. travel and added players, which I actually kind of hit me during the week. Jesus, if Munster could pick the same 23, you know, and have that bit of a buzz and adrenaline, whereas undoubtedly there's guys in the Munster dressing room going, Jesus, we're mm. missing Snyman and yeah. Connor Murray and Feketo and Nash and Dermot Barron probably hasn't trained a lot on Mahoney's, probably hasn't trained a lot. You know, they're not sure who's playing in the wing. The coach is scrambling for players. There's a bit more mm. turmoil going on there. So they're in a good place going under Connacht and they have a real chance, you know, and... Um, Again, ifs and buts about the power, but I think they're capable and and they will feel very good about themselves. They're they're you know they've a real chance here and and possibly can cause them a lot of problems. There seemed to be a lot of talk in South Africa during the week about the pitch again. Like this it's, discussion, it's, it's, it's falling apart apparently. It's the storms. Horrendous. I think they, have, they had surface, a monster truck yeah. rally on it and stuff. There, like, is a, there is a new surface going down there. John de Villiers told me that a couple of weeks ago, and we were there for the monster game. So. Um, such a beautiful stadium built for the World Cup yeah. um, it's it's a fantastic venue a great place it's 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 very intimate mm. and um, a lovely stadium could be a mud bath I think it was given yeah. a rain today yeah. and these yeah. days and that's, again. that's I don't know, I'm not sure if that, that won't suit Connick they'd want yeah. a fast yeah. track they'd love a fast track to play with you know speed and stuff like that but um, Stormers are a very good side a very good attacking side as well so um it's a real interesting one, but you know it's it's a wonderful opportunity for for both underdogs this weekend yeah. to mm. to kind of well cre- everyone, everyone create a bit of grit and determination uh, behind Connacht in the first game anyway. It'll yeah, be, uh, definitely, yeah. definitely, and um, they've done brilliantly. And you know what? I think Andy Friend has done a wonderful job in Connacht. Yeah. Um, I know always the results haven't been where they wanted to, and you know, not been in Europe last year, but um, the way they play and. Um, the buzz and the adrenaline um, that comes out of the sports ground when they mm-hmm. play there and uh, you know he's done a great job and he'll be a loss because he was a gentleman and a great fella to talk to and meet um, and I think he's done a brilliant job with with you know with Connacht uh, Mossy Lawler's going to Munster as well so like all teams you know there, yeah. end up breakups mm-hmm. uh, players moving on coaches moving on but um, I think Andy Friend has been brilliant for Connacht um, the uh, URC Elite 15 as they've called it is, uh, has been named this week as well I always feel I'm a bit queasy about these things coming out when they're such crucial games <laughs> it's like the anti maybe it's the GA I mean, like the surely the team that gets to the final and let's see just like three 
of the three of the most important games have yet to come mm. but here's our team that's ridiculous year. anyway yeah. uh, and it's also like one of the very few uh, teams Quinny that you don't you're not on the selection committee first so you're uh, not happy no, with no. how it's been selected Nobody it's like the can. only teams that should have known they were going to fail before. Uh, the Irish interest in it just in case people haven't seen it uh, Dan Sheen and Finley Bealham are chosen in the front row you've Niall Murray in the second row you've Gavin Coombs uh, in, and Scott Penny in the back row and then across the back you've Ross Byrne and that is where it ends um, from the Irish interest. And there's one player particularly, Quinny, that you're not happy has been left out of it. Um, who's that now? John Klein. Um, I think he's been brilliant this year. Um, I think, in fairness, to, when you look at the team, and I went through this team last night, if you go through all the players, you think, geez, how many games did that guy play? I can't yeah. remember him that much, you know, and, and it's hard to go through every 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 player. Um Darcy Graham, I was thinking for Edinburgh. Jeez, he got injured mm. in that Munster game in December, and you know he came back towards the end of the season. But then, in fairness, he played nine games and he scored twelve tries. Mm. That's a serious return for, for, and he's such a brilliant player. Um, Sione Tupelota from Glasgow, nine games plus the quarter final, so ten. Mm. Um, some players h- high level. Niall Murray in the second row for for Connacht. 15 games plus the quarter final. So he was there ever present and, and I think he's had a brilliant season. Federuc- Federico Ruzza, uh, the Bennett on second row, played nine games. I just think John Klein should be in there. Mm-hmm. And again, I'm pro John Klein. I don't, um, I don't mind saying this. I think he's been, even at the start of the season when Munster were struggling, he was constantly uh, making carries, making tackles, work right through the roof, He's played 17 games this year in, in the league, um, ever present, never injured, constantly at it. And um, I think he's very unlucky. And I probably, you know, obviously from doing the the, the, the Red 78, the Munster yeah. podcast, I, I we picked a star of the week of, you know, part of the analysing the Munster group with, with Neve and myself. And we've picked him loads of times mm. because... He's just been Clown. there all the time. Yeah. So if you're talking about consistency, um, I'd probably get criticised now saying it's monster bias. But I just I, I feel I feel for him because I lo- I love the fact that it's just he's so, the work rate is through the roof constantly. Mm. I know the skills are sometimes questioned. I think they've got better, but other than that, it's a very strong team and, and going through it all. Um, Finley Bealham is in there tight. He's played eleven games and a quarter final, so twelve. Um, some Scott Penny at seven, you know, deserves to be in there. Brilliant, yeah. Um, Grant Williams, a scrum half. I think people, not a lot of people, would have seen a, a huge amount of him up to this year. But he scored a try against Leinster last week. Mm. He's been brilliant in the league as well. So um, again, it's a team that uh, you know, it's people can debate and talk about, but. Um, it's hard to debate it when you look at the number of games and some of the the, the returns these players have had. Are you um, what sort of? You must be doing some gig. There's a gig somewhere for you tomorrow in the uh, in the stadium, isn't there? There's no gig. Is there no gig? No, no. Are you going to it? Um, you have all the stuff on. You no, watch I it? haven't. I might. I might watch on TV. Yeah. I'm not working for it tomorrow, yeah. so um, busman's holiday. I sit back and, and relax, and uh, hopefully. Uh, you might be travelling to South Africa next week if Munster ah. to win <laughs> play the <laughs> Stormers or else it'd be uh, Munster Connacht maybe Monster Connacht. sorry yeah. Jeez, why would I yeah. be going to exactly. it'd be Monster, Monster Connacht, Connacht. Yeah. and Tom and Park next week I'm looking forward to a big time I must say I was having the two kids booked in so we're uh, if you go to Limerick down. next week to see Munster Connacht uh, we'll in the see, final we'll see how the weekend unfolds Penny. <laughs> that politically it's all about stepping around politically this morning thanks a million enjoy the games over the weekend thanks, thanks, Penny. thanks for that and uh, loads of comments coming in so please do uh, keep them coming in and we'll come to some of those um, even some of the more outrageous ones maybe a little bit later we went in. a bit rounder out there it's rugby country is it as Donald <laughs> Cusack said a lot of rugby covered this morning <laughs> and more to come <laughs> More, yeah, to come. more to come uh, we'll be joined a little bit later on by two of Ireland's four uh, officials for the Rugby World Cup 2023 confirmed yesterday Joy Neville the first ever woman to be appointed to a men's Rugby World Cup and Andrew Brace as well both will be with us in a little bit we're going to talk to Jason McAteer later in the show coming up in about 40 minutes time where he's going to pick his you had to be there list it's bloody impressive uh, some of them he was involved in himself and uh, the list is pretty star-studded. So that's coming your way at about nine. Uh, and uh, we'll have uh, the latest sports news uh, coming up as well. OTB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night edition is available now. Up next, 
We'll have Conleth Gilligan and Joe Kernan to preview the Ulster football final. But before all of that, Kathleen McNamee speaking to the 1973 Irish team uh, during the week. It's the 50th anniversary of their first ever competitive game. Uh, that's tomorrow when they uh, took on Wales 50 years ago tomorrow. And here's a short clip from Kathleen's chat. You can catch the full uh, range of interviews across our social channels and the podcast network. Um, some of the other girls were saying, like, you know, training sessions weren't massively regular at the time. Some of the squad hadn't even trained together before the Welsh game. What was it like being in that system? Because it must have, like, a sense of camaraderie must have come out of it. Oh, in it, did, it did. Well, you see, we didn't take any notice because we didn't train anyway. I played uh, with a team that we put into the Cloud Festival, Happy Wanderers. And the next thing is somebody said, will you come up to Dublin for trials? And I said, are they joking? But anyway... Uh, no, there was no training whatsoever. Like uh, nutrition, we were looking to have some nutrition at home, don't mind, for the team. But we were a great bunch. We knitted together and we played for each other. And that's what made the team the way it was. And uh, just a very close knit team. And we played for each other. And that was. OTB AM. The Sports Breakfast Show from Off the Ball. OTB GAA Through when Mike retired I became the heaviest player in the dressing room so I was often on Paul Gadden's back before we games <laughs> I think it was a thing about firing up the quads for being explosive around the pitch maybe not the safest thing in the world to have the likes of myself and Mike on your back but it was definitely something that he did before every game Subscribe to the OTB GAA podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts OCB AM with Gillette Labs get the ultimate shave or your money back Neon Night Edition available now all right, coming up on 24 minutes past eight, delighted she could be with us on OTBN this morning. We're about to talk about the Ulster football final, but before we just wanted to acknowledge that there's a separate and significant issue that has cropped up in relation to the dairy manager, Rory Gallagher, this week. Very legally, personally sensitive area, of course, and not one that we're going to discuss now, nor would it be in any way appropriate for us to do that. Uh, we're going to continue to report on it, of course, uh, but for the purposes of this ne- next segment, we're previewing the Ulster football final. We will not be discussing or alluding to any aspect of it. Uh, we're going to look ahead to uh, Derry Matt. I'd like to say Joe Kernan and Conleth Gilligan are on the line. Morning, <coughs> gents. Good morning, yes. And thanks, Millie, for jumping on. A couple of Ulster teams, obviously, uh, in, in the overall uh, broader context in the lead into the game, a couple of Ulster teams relegated from Division 1. Uh, there is, of course, one coming back up, but some of the heavyweights, Donegal, uh, Tyrone, um, you know, not, not added in a way that Derry have become one of those sort of constants and could go on to win it overall, of course. Um, Ulster football, though, and I appreciate the antagonistic note that we're starting on here, doesn't feel as if it's in the place that it once was or that teams have that same fear of Ulster football that it once had, Joe. Uh, well, every few years things change and the dominance of sort of our man thrown for uh, seven or eight years, things change and, and new teams come in and this is where Derry now come in and they the reigning champions and had a good league form and are now in, in their second all stuff final in a row. So, but we've been working hard now, Mal, like other counties, to try and get back to where we were. And while we haven't appeared in any finals, we we have a good squad of players, and we're very hopeful this year that we we, we can get silverware. Yeah, what do you think, Conlon? Like that point about like the style, the personality of Ulster football feels as if it's changed slightly. It's become a bit more free flowing, free scoring. But conversely, it feels as if like there's a lot of teams that are not as fearful of playing them anymore. Yeah, look, I, I don't know if it's subscribed to that. I think it has got a wee bit more attack, and I think 18, 19, 20 points a game has become the norm in, in Ulster. So I think if you look at other than Dublin and perhaps Kerry, I don't think anybody really would fancy Tyrone, Derry, Armagh, Monaghan, you know, away from home. So I think probably that's maybe for me, it's a bit wide off the mark, but I take your wider point. I agree with you, Connors. As a man, as a man, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not having it at all. Not numbered here. I appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, to be fair, we've, we've three Ulster men against one uh, Leinster man. No, I, think, I think if you look at league positions, I know. All right, Donegal's going down, Jerry's going up. But if you look at even the end of the league, how it finished, you know, Chavin were strong, the Mano were strong, Antrim finished their league relatively strong. So I think Ulster football is probably in as good a place as it as it's been for a while. 
I'm curious, um, like Joe, this is Armagh's first Ulster final since since 2008, I think it is, when they beat uh, Fermanagh. Like, is there pressure massively so on Kieran McGinney? Because there's there's all this talk about the provincial championships and and the importance or lack thereof that they hold nowadays. But for McGinney, I mean, he really, really would would love to win this Ulster championship, and it probably needs to as well. Like in fairness, when he took over, Armagh um, was at a, a fairly low ebb, and he has worked hard. Uh, over this last seven or eight years, but he has a team there now that we've seen that in last year's National League and last year's Championship. They're unlucky to go out to Galway, uh, but it's just getting that bit of luck, and that's one thing I have. I think I'm a have this year. They're getting goals, which they were finding hard to get in other teams, and every team that ever wins anything needs a wee bit of luck. We've we've got a few goals uh, that has turned game for us. But I'm just looking at our forward line here. We have six scoring forwards. We have three scoring halfbacks. And, you know, everybody on the field, a bit like Derry. Derry have players coming up, popping up and scoring from everywhere. But I would just like to see us a wee bit more attack-minded and get the ball up earlier. And I think we're in with a great chance tomorrow uh, uh, if we could do that. That's probably the nub of it in, from an Armagh point of view. Is it like in terms of the, the league, Joe, and there was a bit of criticism about them maybe not being as ambitious as they might have been. <laughs> Suddenly we kicked into championship and you had obviously against Antrim, against Cavan, 4-10 against Down suggests that they were certainly showing more ambition. Maybe you could, if you were to be overly critical, you could talk about the quality of opposition there. But is are you seeing a development on that side from Armagh even over the last three games? Yeah, and and from a supporter's point of view, you were disappointed why we didn't see some of that in the National League. We lost most, any matches we lost, they put us down with one or two points. So it shows how close we were against the best teams in the country if we had to go that wee bit more. But now in the Championship, and Ulster is a minefield, so you have to beat the teams that you meet. They mightn't have been the best. I personally was very worried about the Cavan game. I thought in Breffney Park that we would have been really up against it. Uh, we got the goals early on and mm. put Cavan on the back foot and, and, and won convincingly. Well, I can't say that. Reno O'Neill took off a save that any goal Chippo would have been proud of. But, you know, we, we were certainly the best team in those three games. So we're here on merit. And the one thing you learn from every game, the more games you play and the more games you win, actually the better you get because the confidence grows in the squad itself. If there was any doubts after the National League, the team would be very confident in into this now. But to know this is their biggest test so far. And scores wins games but we have the men that can get the scores if we can get the ball up early there's not a full back lane in the country that is good under a high ball and we just don't get the ball up there quick enough it's no good hitting it in high when there's when the, the opposition have 12 or 14 men behind the ball you got to break get it up early and that's when you can cause the damage and that's what i'm hoping we'll do tomorrow leave a few men up two or three men in the forward lane because if you leave men in the forward lane the defenders won't leave you now, and last year's Ulster final, uh, Donegal and Derry, if Michael Murphy had to stay in the square and, and somebody else take Brendan Rodgers and run up and down the field with him, I think probably Donegal could have won that match. So, there'd be a bit of cat and mouse. <laughs> bit of cat and mouse, surely. Uh, Joe, uh, from your, the Derry perspective, Conneth, like that, that spread of scorers that we discussed with Armagh is, is also pertinent to, to Derry as well. Like I was at the Derry Monaghan semi-final, super impressed by... Not just the, the shot selection, but also the accuracy was, was unbelievable from Derry that afternoon. Shane McGuigan, uh, nine points, five of them from freeze. But you look at the, the, the other scorers as well, the likes of Paul Cassidy, Ethan Doherty, Niall Toner, Conor Glass pops up with a couple of scores every game as well. So the spread of scores, I think they had 10 different scorers overall. And that's, that's something that Derry have really improved on. Yeah, they have, and that's become the norm. You know, it's not unusual now for some of the defenders to, to kick points in, in every game. And I think that is the one area where Derry have been so fluid. Like, if you look at the probable team that Derry's going to play on Sunday, the nine of that starting team are defenders by nature. You know, if you take George McKinless stuff wearing 11 but going back, if you take Brenton Rogers as an actual defender, you know, the possibility of Tune McFall maybe starting, it just shows how fluid the game has become. It's not really about forwards and defenders anymore. It's about players that can do the job in the position that's needed at that time. And, and the way Derry have played and, and the fact that they've been able to tactically change from last year and get more offensive. Like, very few teams have scored more and through the league nobody had conceded less. So the platform that Derry have there is very, very solid. And I think when you look back at some of the games, the one concern would be is that between the league final, like, they conceded four goals, then they conceded two goals in the next game, conceded two goals against Monaghan. So that would be the big concern 
and the fact that when Conor Glass was off the beat the last week, but even when he was on again, Monaghan, they were vulnerable down the middle. And you know that's probably what Derry had worked on because Armagh have straight runners. They'll the players that can get ahead of the ball, and that would be the danger. And when they haven't scored a lot of goals through the league, the four goals they scored against Down probably would suggest they can mix it, they can play a tie. Liam Reid's goal in a game that he was quite just showed the quality that he possesses. Kind of like Joe mentions about like Armagh's sort of um, uh, maybe lack of urgency to get the ball forward as quick as they can to get ahead of that defensive wave. Derry certainly are in that area as well in terms of that uh, ability to knock it around a little bit and show uh, no great urgency to get it forward, despite the fact that, as we've already said, both of them are very free scoring. In terms of the styles then of both teams, what is what is your expectation for, like they both show similar traits in that regard, what's your expectation for Sunday in terms of the two styles? Well, I think with Derry, you know now what they're going to do. You can pick their team and then the only thing will be, will they throw the dice with Kieran McFall from the start? That will be the only deviation from what has happened in the Monaghan or the Fermanagh game. I suppose Armagh is a wee bit more unknown. Um, you know, does Barry McCambridge come back in after a brilliant league? Andrew Murnham went off injured. Ben Creeley went off injured. You know, Stephen Campbell didn't start the last day. So there's probably more unknowns for for Armagh in terms of selection and how they're going to play. Joe made a brilliant point, I think, and I think he's right. There's very few teams in the country that have as many top end forwards as Armagh have. But adversely, if you look at it the last day when Ray O'Neill come back. <clears throat> Herbert was moving amongst the previous two games. When Ray O'Neill comes back, he assumes a free taking role again, and Turbot completely goes out of the game and has eventually taken off in a year where he has been magnificent. So the issue will be for me is Jan Armagh play all those players because obviously the one forward they have would be more workman like would be Jamar Hall. Do they opt for Stephen Campbell, who would be more free scored to the goal from Jamar Hall, who's that defensive link player? You know, so I think Armagh know exactly what they're going to do. Derry probably aren't this year of who Armagh is going to select in those positions. What do they do, Joe, with that efficiency that the two lads were talking about? What do Armagh do with that? Like 114 from 18 shots, I think, in the last game. If you were putting a team out against them, is it that sort of niggly bit of play that you can get in and try and off-balance a player or make them think twice about it? Or What What are your thoughts about trying to upset that efficiency? <clears throat> well, I, I think uh, as far as Derry's concerned, the man-to-man marking is excellent. And they're able to turn defence into attack from the man-to-man mark. And hopefully, I'm, uh, and in a lot of games this year, that people seem to, or players seem to look after, oh, that's my man, I have to stay with him. The old saying is, and it's very relevant in today's game, the man that's on the ball is, is where the danger is. And too many men stand watching their man as the danger man goes past them and breaks the lane, and all of a sudden, the whole team is under pressure. And that's one thing that I, I, I hope I might do. And, and if Monaghan had to do that, they might have been in the trouble that they were. But Derry are so good at changing, as Conn had said, from defence to attack. They're all comfortable on the ball. They're all good at shooting. Last year in the Championship, Derry, every time they got inside the 21, they were shooting for goals. They were that competent. So we have to try and nullify them coming out with the ball. You know, from the kickouts in particular, I think that if we can stop the short kickouts, that's going to nullify the midfield. Derry probably have the best midfield in the pair on the in the country, and having Kieran McFall to come in there if there is a problem, you know, that's even more cover. But I, I think stop the kickouts, win them or break even in the midfield battle, and stop the runner on the ball is the three things that I'd be looking for Ahmad to do. If we get the ball, we're dangerous. But if we allow them to come at us, we're in big trouble. I know there's been a lot of talk, Joe, about um, people saying, you know, Armagh need to play their own game and not set up defensively, as you say, and, and go for broke, like the, especially did in the second half against Down. When you talk there about th- that word nullify, nullifying the, the Derry attack and the way they move from 1 to 15 so quickly, like we've already spoken about the dark arts on the show this morning, and I would, of course, never accuse Armagh of engaging in, in dark arts at any point, but. Is that something that you can utilise against a team like Derry who are so fast, bring the ball up, ball up the pitch, that you can maybe slow the game down in, in cute, uh, cute ways maybe? Well, look, if you try and win the ball up front from every kick out, like if you mark from the outside in, that means the, the keeper cannot hit short balls out to the cornerbacks. <clears throat> and that means the ball can only go one way and that's straight down the middle. And you have a, cranc- a chance of crowding it, winning a break ball. And then if you don't win it, you can do that wee dark art of pulling a jersey, stopping a man and giving you a chance, a few seconds to get a man back. 
But the, I think the secret is, is in today's game is try and win the ball up front from the kickouts, and you have to take a chance. You have to be brave. But if you let teams like Derry come at you in droves all the time, they're going to pick wee holes and they're going to get the scores. Uh, Dan, uh, even on that, I remember watching. I was watching the Mahan match, and, and I noticed at one point Mahan scored a goal in the first half. Connolly, and I think it was Carlo Connell's finish, and I saw one of the Mahan players, uh, maybe accidentally, of course, but as he was running away, he kicked the the goalkeeper's tee um, away from its usual position, just to you know slow down the result and kick out. But that's obviously a ploy that that teams uh, utilise. One of the things I yeah, want to ask. Yeah, I guess Bonner was surprised he's at the tea stay. I just thought he was stuck down the with him. That would be usual. That would be usual was laying out there. That's fair. You know your audience here, of course. Um, the, one, of the, one of the quotes I, I was reading during the week, uh, Connell from, from Chrissy McCaig, he was talking about the no longer being Derry captain this season. Uh, I thought it was interesting, and he actually was acknowledging it, and he said that he thinks it's good for the team overall, making the team better, creating new leaders in that dressing room. And I think that that's an important thing as well, isn't it? That you not just the passing around the armband, but but I guess getting more more players to the point of being in those leadership roles, and it's only going to take the team on further. Yeah, I think so. And I think in a lot of places, in a lot of teams, the, the captaincy is symbolic. You know, leaders in the team don't necessarily go up and lift the cup. And you've seen that particularly in years gone by where sort of some of the Jerry subs who have been the captain from the previous county champions have lifted the cup and the leaders in that dairy team, you know, you have, you have Glass obviously now assumed that, but he was leading anyway last year. You know, Chris McGee's not going to change whether he's lifting the cup or, or has the armband or not. So I think that's more symbolic, but Derry really have, you know, if you look at, you know, Ethan Doherty has really developed in that player who every touch he has is always sort of really important. The amount of scores that come off him, you know, he's always the man that's drawn two or three players and creating an overlap. So like, I think Derry really have stepped up and you know, even like last year, like, Orrin Lynch was much maligned in terms of some of his performances. You know, obviously the goal game where he got caught out and went out the field. But he has turned that around this year. You know, he's come back from pre-season in brilliant shape. He's now added a wee bit more the game when he comes out the field. And, and for me, one of the big things this weekend, which there was much talk about in real business, is Ethan Rafferty's role, is Orrin Lynch's role. Both of them play very similar. They've scored, well, I think Rafferty's won four so far. And Lynch is the five points. Interestingly, he scored one in each of the games. Okay, so it'll be the battles like that there that it'll be interesting to see who Derry decide when Ethan Rafferty goes to pick him up because down done that and that sort of really nullified him. But it meant that they have to get up elsewhere. So it's all those things. Whenever Derry <coughs> over over one side and Lynch comes up over the other side, do they mark them? You know, and that's a real interesting one of how both teams cope with that. Mm. Uh, just a brief, uh, brief final one for myself. On uh, I was reading a piece last week uh, on Caseman Park and um, the redevelopment, and the argument was made that that Caseman Park should be utilised as the venue for Ulster Senior Football Finals going forward. Of course, I'm going to come out, come with the uh, the Monaghan angle here and say tradition should trump all that. And uh, I know I've, I've probably seen both of you walking up that hill in Clonus on a sunny Ulster final day, and and just the the history behind the place. Uh, Joe, where do you where do you stand on that? Uh, scenario because I'm, I'm sure it's a difficult one for for Ulster GA most people want a lot of people want to keep it in Clonus and then there's the argument that if they're putting so much money into the redevelopment of Casement it should be moved there what's your what are your thoughts uh, well uh, just like you I had many happy memories and a few disappointing ones in Clonus <laughs> uh, Clonus is one of those venues that is <coughs> an unbelievable atmosphere you're down in a column it, it, uh, it's like one of those places in Rome uh, where the gladiators win to fight on a hot summer's day. It's unbelievable. But we do need a new stadium, uh, and, and, and whether it's Belfast or somewhere else. Uh, Antrim football certainly need a stadium. Uh, the one thing about Belfast, you're not going to be able to stay the way you stay in Clonus and you stop on the villages on the way home. So everybody gets a turn and there's an atmosphere whether you win, lose or draw. You know, it, it's great walking down the street with people and hopping in the cars and then going to a different village or stopping in Blaney on, on my way home. So you'll miss all that. And 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 Clonus has been great. And and they have developed Clonus. The pitch is great. Uh, the seat now, the, the whole thing is, has improved. But we do need another stadium. And I suppose Belfast is the best place. But one thing we'll certainly have is happy memories of, of Clonus over the years. Uh, Joe, a word on your old uh, your old uh, captain, obviously in Kier McGinney, eight years in, and like it's a long time between drinks. Is there a, still a sense of positivity around him and his team, and and generally about the progress of the team? Wait a second, all, all managers go through. If you lose one or two matches, you know the, the the natives are out and they're looking to get rid of you. 
there's nobody can say that there hasn't been a lot of hard work done with this team you know and and they, and they can be one of the teams that over the next two or three years they would have a chance a chance of winning in all Ireland but everybody is judged on success we're here now this is the day that we have to produce it we have the men to do it I just hope that the handcuff comes off and, and, and we utilise and we see these players perform at the level they can I think it's the same in every county players are a wee bit afraid uh, 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 to just go for it at times in case they lose the ball and mm. somebody gets a score and, and it goes against them. But I, I, I think what we've seen that over this last three games, there is a growing uh, confidence in the team. Uh, and uh, Wait a second. I, I don't think there'll be much in it. I think that a, a kick of a ball w- uh, will be the difference here. It's who's forward settled down the best. Who makes the least mistakes? And 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 I just hope we go for it. We have the men to win this match. So, uh, for Cairn's sake, certainly I hope uh, that we win this one. It, it'll be great for all the work. Nobody can say that Cairn hasn't worked hard at this. It, it's his heart and soul. You know, you know by listening to him or talking to him. And every one of these players are behind him. So hopefully we do enough on the day. And, and a wee bit of luck on the day can it can make a difference. In a word, are you both predicting your native counties? Oh yes. Yeah. <clears throat> but it will be close. Point or two at the most. I'm out to win. Conleth? Yeah, look, I think Joe's right. I think, uh, it will be very, very close. It, it could take extra time and, and beyond like last year. But I just feel that Derry's system of play, how they've evolved, the pressure is not on them in the same way. They've won that Ulster last year. Now they're looking to go a wee bit beyond that. And I think they haven't improved, I agree. They're probably not at the carry goal level, you know, just Dublin level just yet in terms of championship. But I think they'll go on that direction. I think probably Armagh have the players to pull off a, a big game and to win it. But I just think Derry systematically will do what it takes to win and they'll get over the line, but it'll be by the minimum. Thanks a minute for jumping on. You gotta remember, boys. This is Ulster. Anything can happen. <laughs> happen. Nothing. And never, never <laughs> truer than this particular final. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, Connor, yeah. thanks a million. Cheers, right, boys. Thanks, Good luck. Cheers, Good luck. Um, interesting stuff. I love it. They're both predicting their own county by the bare minimum, basically. It's um, slightly antagonistic, antagonistic notes start off them, but it does feel as if, from a non Ulster person, mm. it feels as if like we have a final to look forward to. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, of course. It can often not feel that way. Well, I mean, it can be a bit of a you know. I said Ulster finals can be can be. Oh, yeah. Last year was good. Like it was, it was good in terms of it went extra time. It was yeah. close. Now Donegal probably at the end should have gone for broken. Mm. Probably could have beaten Derry on that day, but didn't probably go for it. Um, I think I, I like the way Ulster football has gone. So because for years there it was Tyrone Monaghan and Donegal that were winning Ulsters, mm. um, and now it's completely flipped. And, and Armagh and Derry are the probably the two best teams. Great in the to see Armagh back. It must oh, be said, like it's... but I think as I think Colin's point is is important. Cavan have come good. Uh, they won that COVID Ulster, of course. Uh, well, like they've pushed on the, the Talton Cup final know. last year. I don't know against your own county. Yeah, I don't know that they've come. Like speaking to Cavan people, I, a lot of Cavan people do not feel as if they've come good. No. Well, like, what's the evidence for that? Solid league campaigns. Absolutely, did well getting getting out of Division Three. You know my own frustrations about that. So yeah. they did they did what was needed and they got out of it. Um, they should have got out of it. Mm. And they did get out of it. And then when it came to Ulster, they just fell, fell flat in their yeah, back. Yeah, to be honest, I thought they'd, they'd do more against Armagh. Yeah. I expected like the game was up after, whatever, 20 minutes. Or yeah, was. that was disappointing, I think, from a Cavan perspective. No, but then and good teams are allowed a bad a bad day at the office. That, that, my point is, I'm not sure about the depth. In Ulster? Yeah. Well, down as well have, have been playing really good football. Oof. Like, I know Armagh... Be- I think if you're holding down up as a... No, but like, you look at other provinces, they do not have the strength in depth of counties as Ulster do. Even Antrim had a good league campaign as well, decent in terms of some of the results they got. I'd have uh, to have a look at the well. power rankings to see what, yeah. what's the makeup of the top 10. What are the averages? But like, I mean, if you go by the leagues... But like only one team can the win. The leagues doesn't play out your point. Well, next year, who's going to be in the, in the top tier? Of the eight teams in Division 1, you're going to have Tyrone, Derry, Monaghan, and yeah. the other Ulster teams. In Division 1? Yeah, no. like... But it's still... Like Donegal and Armagh gone, obviously. Donegal and Armagh gone. There's always a solid Ulster... Representation. Yeah. Um, now the leagues obviously aren't to be all and end all, but I think they're a good indicator. They need an Ulster team to go on and push on and win the All Ireland. Like Derry could be that team this year. Derry could well be that. Derry could well be that team. Um, now, few comments coming into us here. Um, P well seventy four says Munster have turned the corner so many times this season. They're now going round in circles. <laughs> um, all of these things are true until they're not true. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Like, uh, as in. You know, the same point about that, that Quinny was making about Connex when he was in earlier on, 
that like you know they're in bonus territory and all this sort of stuff like yeah. and they go ahead and win that game suddenly you're and that's really why I you know I know it's the team of the year is a sort of a flippant like who really cares type mm. thing but like how the hell are you picking a team of the year that's before the is. most important three games are played it is ridiculous. it just makes no sense you have to wait it towards the teams that have done well not because you're being you're cherry picking anything but because like that they will contain the best players well this is like picking the all-star team before the all-ireland semi-finals like essentially do you know why I think they do it I think they do it because the likes of Leinster will field a first 15 in the final game in a way that they won't have done for most of the season so, so they don't, actually don't want to be putting like if he was fit Johnny Sexton in the team or they, they should want just to be, be brave and put the players that have played a lot of games across yeah, the URC they should, say, they should say like okay you have to have played 10 games in yeah. the URC to qualify to make this but a lot of these decision making I mean I, like Shane Walsh was the man of the match in the All-Ireland final last year but it was given to Clifford because he was on the winning team Clifford was brilliant as well but you know it's kind of uh, I, look at I, I was, there was a conversation for sure <laughs> yeah, there was there had a conversation to be. for sure one yeah. of the best performances I've ever seen in Croke Park Shane Walsh's but listen decision making I mean, in Clifford these teams was of the year the charts as well, of course yeah. he was um, schedule for the URC and Champions Cup is BS just totally undermining the game this weekend says Michael White um Will Leinster have to be protected from the other teams as the only ones who don't cheat? Says Danny Mack with his tongue in his cheek. <laughs> I'm assuming. Um, James Gill says, uh, James Tracy is very good and to be fair, Quinny is very good as always. Fair to Leinster, which must be hard for him. Uh, Ulster are strong, but Kerry have stepped it up over the last three years, says uh, Michael. Uh, and he goes on to say that Joel's right there. Great ploy to break defensive structures and cause a bit of chaos. Mm. There is a bit of cute cute stuff in, in Ulster football for sure in, 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 in all, every province I'd imagine but I, I definitely noticed a few things in that Derry Monaghan match where I was like oh yeah this is this is Ulster yeah do you know there could um, there could be a bit of chaos this weekend in the way that both teams um, play the game um, Connor Joyce that should have been a yellow card Ulster teams tripping over each other to do everything bar play football uh, there was one game <laughs> hey, in Ulster did you see the year. Tyrone Monaghan match Tyrone, there was one game in Ulster this year yeah. Tyrone and Monaghan every other game was over well before the finish yeah that, that's been the disappointing thing of the Ulster Championship this year. I'd like, I'd love to see the final now on Sunday, and I think it will be remarkably close. Are you going up to it? Uh, no, this is the thing. The ticket situation, no one can get tickets. They weren't put in general sale. Through um, the clubs only. Through the clubs only. That What's was the, the capacity? Jeez, so, uh, it's 35 odd thousand, I think. And they sold all them through the no, clubs? It might, it might be less, but it's um, they sold them all through the clubs, which is, which is remarkable when you think about it. So it was heading for a sellout, so a safe capacity of Clonus is now capped at 28,750. Right, that's so the, the, yeah, the option to buy online was unavailable according to the website, but uh, dozens of clubs in both counties probably comfortably getting and rid of it. And how are your connections? I know. You'd wonder. If anyone out there has a spare ticket or well, two, you know, give me a shout. See, I, but then I feel bad. I'm not from. I'm with Ulster out of the the URC and everything. You're just you're at a loss now. Like. This is it. But you know, you feel like you're robbing a ticket from someone if you're if you're not from Armagh or Derry. I was born in Armagh. Right. I was born in Armagh, Adrian. You I are claim honestly that. with every week that goes by, you and Charlie Hahi start to sort of merge together into yeah. the one sort of being. Possibly. Uh, there's yeah. not a county in Ireland that you haven't got some association. Ah no, Dad's from Galway, Mum's from Monaghan, Granny's from Tyrone, and I was born, born in Armagh. Armagh, but like shipped home three days later. Shipped home. Yeah, yeah. Didn't spend too much time there. No, Do you know. No. That Daisy Hill Hospital had me for but a don't be days. worried about taking a ticket off someone that's like yeah fair enough there. if anyone has a ticket give me a shout uh, 10 to 9 you are watching OTB AM and we still have you had to be there to come with uh, Jason McAteer uh, that's coming a little bit later on and he's got an unbelievable list so we'll come to that in a bit OTB AM with Gillette Labs get the ultimate shave or your money back Neon Night edition is available now delighted to say that uh, four Irish officials have been named in the 26 uh, panel for, of officials for Rugby World Cup 2023 and we're joined on the line by two of them this morning Joy Neville Andrew Brace good morning and congrats Good morning Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Congrats to you both that's um, a, an amazing achievement is it something that you know is coming in the post Joy or is it landed on you? Ah no geez, nothing's for certain I mean you, you take nothing for granted um, amongst a lot of, of great competitors and um we obviously found out last week I mean, to keep it on the, on the, on the low and um, I think it was a bit surreal. It probably still is a bit surreal. It's become a little bit more real now since it's been announced. Yeah. It's exciting. It's daunting. Um, but yeah, it's a challenge I'm, I'm, I'm thoroughly looking forward to. How did you find out? Uh, we, we each got a call from the referee manager, Joel Jush, um, who paused momentarily before he said you're in or out. Uh, at that point, I said, Joel, I could kill you there. Um, but... 
you know, it's 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 funny because my, my dad passed away about three three months ago, and uh, he was always the port of call, you know, and anything rugby related. And immediately I said, "Just I'm mustering dad." So it was it was quite an emotional moment really yeah. for me. I'm sorry to hear that. I didn't know, and I was actually the next question I was going to ask you about the first. Um, call that you made it's always those little sort of life events where you forget about it momentarily and then suddenly you're like that would have been the call yeah for sure well uh, my brother ronnie was was next up um definitely next up in line in the, in the rugby front from a, a conversation between myself and, and ronnie and dad always um so um yeah no he he he, he, st- he stood up um to the mark so. stood up to the plate good um and i'm sure he's uh, smiling down with with the achievement that's in it which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail and on andrew for your uh, for yourself uh, second rugby world cup no more than joy was this um something you knew was coming down the track or you are waiting for that call um look for for me shane i similar to joy i'm hugely excited um to be selected obviously in 2019 i was i was only there as an assistant referee which is a bit bittersweet it's like being on the bench I guess as a player um, so you want to be there in the middle and and for me that was always the goal uh, 10 years ago when I started out with the IRFU um, like the goal was always to, to get to 2023 as a referee and uh, 2019 was was a, an amazing experience to to see that and learn from from other experienced referees um, and yeah, now going into into France is is to be there in the middle is a uh, hugely exciting one that I'm thoroughly honoured uh, and immensely proud of um, to represent the RFU on on that bigger stage and and to have that with such a strong representation from Ireland as you said with Joey, Chris, and Brian that um, is is fantastic. So yeah, it's brilliant for for the four of us. There's a lot of bit of pressure, Andrew. Those those World Cup games, as opposed to the other, the other games you referee. I'm sure, from a referee's perspective, if you're not being talked about after the match, that's when you know you've had a good game. So, uh, the hope is that during the World Cup, your name won't come up at all. I guess. Yeah, very much so. I think uh, we'd all agree that, and it's not getting any easier. Um, that's for sure. And look, going into into the biggest uh, tournament in the in the world, um, you, you need to perform that. Obviously, the expectation is more than it's ever been, and. And uh, and and for us, obviously, those big games. We've done a, a lot of big games recently, from Six Nations into into European knockout games, into it back into URC. So we're at the business end of the season now, domestically. Um, so for us, then, obviously, to build into those uh, TRC World, World Cup warm up games in the summer, um, we'll hopefully put a put a good uh, uh, marker there leading into into the World Cup. Around uh, consistency for us, like obviously myself and Joy and Chris and Brian are, are, are very used to working together as a team, and uh, yeah, that would be important to get that consistency uh, going into into the Rugby World Cup. You won't know your games, I think, for a while yet, but will you get to stick together as a group? Is that the way it works, or you just go into a pot and they sort of disperse everybody out as they see fit? Yeah, I th- well, we know our warm up games um, and the Rugby Championship. So myself and Joy and. Brian and Chris, as I, as I, as I mentioned, that we're working together going into um, South Africa, Argentina, and then uh, and then go over to Argentina, work with Nika then to run touch, and then the warm up games in August. So I think Joy is is going to be working as well in the in the Junior World Cup, um, and and then the warm up games then through the summer as well. So I, we don't know the, the the fixtures for Rugby World Cup, but they'll be announced in June when we get together in a camp in Toulouse end of June. Um, so yeah, you'd 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 hope that obviously that team will will work together leading into the World Cup and to, as I as I mentioned there to for that consistency that everybody wants. So that's important. Yeah, uh, Joy, it's not your first World Cup. You've refereed a World Cup final, so you're um, you're a veteran at that aspect of it. But the first woman to officiate at a men's uh, rugby World Cup, which is another incredible achievement, another hurdle down. Yeah, well, look, Adrian, I suppose. Um I don't. I don't particularly look at it that way. Like I'm, I'm delighted to to have been selected. But I'm. I've always ever just. I suppose I've always asked to be treated equally with my male counterparts. I'm there to compete with the rest. Um, like I drop personally drop a lot of tags and labels. And I think if you're if you're good enough, if, um, all I wanted to do was get there and merge through performances and. Um, and you know, I suppose this opportunity kind of landed in my lap. I um, I had my baby boy two years ago, and as a result of being pregnant, I couldn't be you know active on field. So an opportunity to go into TMOing, and then it was quite evident that there was an, another opportunity then to get to the men's World Cup as a TMO. And you know, I, you know, I took I, I took you know, 
I saw it as a massive chance to, to get to a men's world cup and, and thankfully put the head down and worked hard and um, thankfully got there and you know what the sweet spot is I suppose for me especially is the fact that I was always competing with Brian McNeese uh, you know the, the, I suppose the dialogue would have been that one or the other would go mm. um, and now that World Rugby have chosen to bring in this new bunker system which means they, they upped the, the TMOs, the number from five to seven. And I'm delighted to be sat here knowing that my friend and I would both now go um, to the World Cup to, to support each other and, um, and you know, uh, enjoy the experience together. That's class. What's the, what is the bunker system? Um, have you seen it in the, the, the Southern Hemisphere at all? No. Are you aware? Um, so basically it's, it's something that they've tried down south whereby... Um, a referee sees foul play and will automatically, if they see it as a yellow card threshold, they give the yellow card. Um, and the on the on field TMO then has eight minutes uh, to decide whether to upgrade that to a red card or oh, not. Yeah. Um, so in this case for the men's World Cup, um, there will be on field the, the on field team ref two ARs and the the match TMO, and then uh, in another venue there will be a bunker. Where there'll be um, a bunker TMO and a another, like another TMO or another assistant referee. So you know, the, those those people are part of our group, and we we will decide then whether we upgrade that to a red or not. Uh, Joy, um, we were speaking there about how the game is not getting any easier, and to referee and that position certainly is not getting any easier. And Andrew touched on that there, but from your perspective, how have you how have you noticed that in the last number of years? Social media clearly is, is an element that, that plays into it as well. There's ambiguity around a lot of the laws in rugby which makes it, you know, difficult for referees in the first place. So how have you how have you found that progression in the last number of years in terms of I guess social media abuse and, and the uh, the microscope being put onto referees' performances? Yeah, look, it's no secret that the game is a great game. You know, it's completely down to the discretion of the referee, the interpretation of what they're seeing. And, and that's why it's such an entertaining game, but at the detriment of the of the officials uh, most of the time. As you said, Adrian, I think it was Adrian that said, um, you know, or no, Shane, you said, um, all, you, all you wish for is, is um, to come away with no attention on the referee mm-hmm. whatsoever. And that is definitely what we try to achieve. Um, you know, as... As social media, you know, in certain platforms, it can be such a benefit. However, sometimes they're the demon. Like um, my biggest gripe would be that the, the lack of accountability. Like you know, the game has become more professional, and um, there's an awful lot more pressure on us. And what I don't kind of agree with as an next player, and what I always thought was, as an next player, you're not going to board, you miss a tackle, and your your pals would slap you in the back and go, "Come on, next one," and and you'd, you'd have your post match analysis, and there would be a room for error. But I think there is a completely unrealistic um, um, in view that the referees need, will get everything right. Like mm. We're human, you know, they were going to make mistakes, and sometimes I think people need to be a little bit more lenient. But just back to the social media thing quickly. Um, for me, the sooner we make like the likes of Twitter accountable, so some you know you you look to to open up an account, you have to add a, a, um, a source of identification because. Whatever about Andy and I, and Andy has, you know, uh, many of these experiences also, like, um, we're, we're old and bold enough, we, we have had some sort of life experience, we're able to filter through the negatives and, and kind of, you know, highlight the positives for our own mental strength. But what I do worry about is young people and, and people with mental health issues, because it could just be one throwaway comment um, that, that the keyboard warrior and that could, you know, uh, push someone over the edge. And, and that's what I truly worry about. You have you have experienced a lot of this as well, Andrew. As Joy says that that England France Autumn Nations Cup final. I know you, you've spoken about this before, but the the uh, the death threats that you would have experienced and and just large scale abuse. I think you had a, maybe a pinned tweet about your about your dad who had passed away, and and people were were even targeting that and targeting other members of your family. So this is something you'd have experienced, unfortunately, as well. Yeah, very much so, uh, Shane. I think look. I, somebody once told me, like, if you put yourself out there, then you take the bad with the good. Um, as Joy has mentioned, alluded to, I think that um, that doesn't make it right. Um, however, I think that's probably the society that we're in now. People can um, make comments and and jump on a on a tweet or a comment um, about performance, and and that's fine. Everybody's entitled to an opinion. And when it crosses that line, then and becomes abuse, then I think that's. Uh, that's what we don't want, and we have to take a strong stand, uh, stance to that. Um, like obviously, yes, I suffered there three years ago in the England France game, but 
for me, the way I look at it, it's, it's been very cathartic in, in terms of that I can, I've moved on from that now and, um, and not to have that, that clutter in my mind just to be overthinking, oh, what are people thinking about my performance then? Um, and just actually focusing on the game itself has been, as I, as I mentioned, has been very cathartic for me to, to move on and really focus going into 2023. And, and to be honest, like I was probably, overthinking everything around selection and my uh, versus my performance and um and for me that was just having a negative impact then on on the actual game itself because i wasn't uh, focusing on myself and controlling um what i can control enough to be accurate when it matters and um and i think that's the temperament that we're all chasing really yeah like it's such um High pressure moment. I think, like I think back to the Ireland England game in the Six Nations, and a key decision has to be made, and there's a lot of deliberation over it. And there's a very clear directive from everybody involved in rugby about protecting players, and particularly around concussion protocols. So that's the over our overarching approach. But within that, then things start to get a bit grey, which is why you have obviously referees and assistant referees and TMOs having those. Uh, long deliberate conversations on the pitch and as you say Joy maybe there's a new system going to come into place that might sort of remove some of that but can I ask you both just before we wrap your experiences or insights on that process of being on the pitch there's like 30, 40, 80,000 people looking at you mm -hmm. and you're aware of like millions of more people looking at home and listening to every single word you have to say that's we, we uh, in the stands and as media and as you know, pundits tend to look at that in a real cold sort of like, you know, uh, you get judged really harshly, really quickly, and not always the uh, bad social media stuff, but just like genuine reaction to it. Can I ask both of your uh, insights and uh, thoughts around that process? Okay, I leave. I leave Andy elaborate in a minute, but before I do so, uh, Adrian, you, you spoke about the pressures of the the. The, the crowds in the stadium, but it's more the pressures of Johnny Lacey, our coach, on detail, detail, mm -hmm. detail. So when you really? talk about communication, <laughs> that was the first thing that came to mind. So that's a shout out to Johnny. <laughs> He's a stickler for, for that's probably why we're, we're, we're sat where we are, to be honest. Um, for me, I, it's just about, and it's, it's learning from experience. Sometimes you allow the externals filter into your mind and, and you start focusing on other things instead of what's in front of you. And I think as you gain experience, you learn to completely block that out in order to be in the moment in the here and now to be able to concentrate solely on, on the decision that needs to be made. But I leave I leave Andy um, elaborate more because he's he's you know he's in front of um, massive numbers a lot more than what I would be. Yeah, I just think from from my perspective, um, for us, we talk a lot about getting what matters, Shane. So like myself and Jordan and, and Brian, who, who are working with a lot in that in the box, is just so key and critical that you have that strong relationship between ref and TMO. And thankfully, myself and Joy and Brian have that and we get on really well and close friends and that and that really helps understanding each other, understand the relationship of what I want, what Joy or Brian wants, what I don't want. Um, because at the end of the day, when you get to a Rugby World Cup, it is about getting what matters and what everybody is talking about, because that's absolutely key. It doesn't matter whether I ref the scrums uh, well, but, uh, but I fail to get that big decision right at the, at the end of the game um, and miss a forward pass or a knock on that leads to a try. So it's a great, great decision making for me isn't always about chasing that best decision. Um, and yes, we know the expectation is more than it's ever been before. But for me, I, I like like from my perspective and my team, like I can't be accurate if I'm desperate. So, um, for like I'm like for me, I, I want to try and be as calm enough to be myself going into into this World Cup and control what I can control. Um, like we talked a lot going into European games of late of of really nailing those big decisions when they present themselves. Um, and at the end of the day, that's what that's what matters. That's what we're all talking about now in the game. Because um, as we know, it's full of grey. We can always find a different decision between breakdown and set piece. But um, and thankfully, we've been supported immensely by the RFU of putting those foundations in place since we've gone full time six years ago. Um, for for me to perform at my best, then when I come to this um, tournament in in September, so um, and like that comes from like. Quality S and C, nutritional support, you know, sports psych. Now with Kevin McMenamin introduced, all of that is going to be hugely important for us to perform and be successful when when we when we when the tournament kicks off in September. 
Yeah, well, listen, we wish you the very best. The uh, best thing I can say is, like Shane said earlier, we hope we don't hear anything about you during the World Cup. And we also hope you don't get the final. So that's uh, <laughs> that's where we hope that. But listen, congrats. It's a great, uh, great story. And we uh, wish you the best of luck. Joy and Andrew, thanks a million for jumping on. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks, Shane. Cheers, guys. Thanks a lot. That's uh, uh, great stuff and good to hear from... It's brilliant to hear from referees. I always feel like that no matter yeah. what sport we're... Um, I think there isn't enough of it. Mm, we often, you often think that referees are closed and they want to talk to media and stuff, but as soon as you talk to them, you're like, they have absolutely no problem but talking. But it's, it's also good to help people. Like, yeah. I will have a different view when I'm sat in the stand at the Aviva now tomorrow. Yeah. I'll be like, okay, hang on a second. I might just well, keep that opinion to myself. Because you'll see the, the referee as, human, exactly. as a human being with a, with a personality there is, there in life. There is no bad that comes from that. It's... yeah. More of it. Oh, and the social media abuse that they have to put up with, I, I just don't understand it. Yeah, it's 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 insane. And uh, I, that was one of the points as well when I was thinking about it beforehand. It was like the, the Razzy Erasmus, when he put that hour-long video up mm. about um, Nick Berry mm. during the After the Lions thing, I was like, that's this is changing. Th- this is going a direction that, that not a lot of people saw it going in. That, you know, imagine us in our jobs if someone posted an hour-long video to social media assessing our... A performance on the show this morning or whatever. It, 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 it's a lot of pressure I'd for, for the referees. YouTube comments. We had the usual. I suppose we get judged. It's it's not maybe not the best example, but it's changed refereeing for sure. It has. Uh, it's seven minutes past nine. Here's what's on the OTP Podcast Network for you today. Uh, League of Ireland match day will be available for you there. Anthony Nash and uh, Rugby Daily as well with all the very latest, as you can see, uh, Dave Carney there following his uh, departure from Leinster. There's no information as to what's happening after that, but all of that is available on the O2B Podcast Network. You can follow O2B across social. Subscribe to the O2B Podcast Network after the ads. It's Jason Mackett here. It's You Had to Be There. It's going to be absolutely epic. During the break, it's the latest episode of The Hurling Pod. James Scahill, Paul Murphy and Will discussing all-time inter-county scoring records. You can catch the full episode uh, the latest Hurling Pod in the OTP Podcast Network and the Hurling Pod is with Board Gosh Energy who are proud sponsors of the Senior Hurling Championship and the Legends Tour Series which takes place at Croke Park. You're listening to OTB AM. AM. The Koi Gig Pod on Off The Ball. Well, I'm smiling from a Manchester United viewpoint. Champions League nearly in the bag. But Man City will be really disappointed. They didn't look like the team that had won, what, like 14 on the trot. They're a bit lacklustre, but I won't take away from Liverpool either. They just got it right in terms of when they needed to press high. And then at the end, when they needed bodies back, they were very, very resilient. Keep up to date with all the WSL action every Tuesday and subscribe to the feed in the OTB Sports app now. Well, Paul, your former teammate TJ Reid is about to become the top scorer in championship history. Didn't quite get there at Corrigan Park. Scored just the 210 in uh, Kilkenny's win, 531 to 320 against Antrim. Uh, but now at this stage, Patrick Horgan is still out just in front, 22 goals, 532. So that's 598. He's definitely going to go over 600, Patrick Horgan, but he does some play until after TJ Reid plays in the next game. So TJ will get next shout. And TJ Reid, after that Antrim game, has gone to 30 goals, 506. That converts to 596 points. So TJ Reid hits three points. He becomes officially the championship top scorer of all time. We waited for so long uh, for this to happen, for Canning to get there, then for Hoagie to go ahead of him. And now it looks like TJ Reid is going to slip ahead of him. Um, it's still going to be a hell of an achievement for TJ Reid, even, even if it is a case of maybe him and Patrick Horgan taking the record from each other over the course of the next few weeks a few times. Ah, yeah, it's it's it's. Um, I suppose we've we've said it several times that other sports, uh, I suppose, highlight these records far more than the GA highlight their own ones. But it's it's brilliant. I I wasn't actually aware that TJ was that close to Patrick Horgan. Again, did himself a huge uh, a huge favor by scoring two ten over the weekend. But yeah, it's it's a great little I suppose side story that the two of them, like two great players, that they're they're might I suppose overtake each other in a neck and neck race until one or either of them finish at some stage but um it's great achievement you know and, and it's huge scoring when you think of it that both players are coming up on 600 points is is remarkable scoring um it, it bodes to i suppose ask the question that in a few years time given the amount of games at the moment we'll probably see players finishing their career with a thousand points you know because uh, patrick Horgan and and uh tj played the majority of their careers where there was four matches a year maybe five matches a year you know so um it's 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 amazing to see where it is, but it's look, it's great for both of them. Either of them finishing up first or second for that period, you know, of their careers, it's a remarkable achievement and something both should definitely take pride in. But uh, I suppose we are just going to take it as a foregone conclusion that TJ managed to squeeze three points in the next game to to, to, to take the mantle for a small bit anyway. Scale. What, what have you scored in championship? 
How many have I scored? Yeah. I think I'm five, so I'm only 593 behind Patrick Horgan, which isn't bad going now. And I still have a bit of time. <laughs> OCB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition, available now. Just so unexpected. It's one of those you had to be there moments. You had to be there. It subsequently genuinely did change everything about my life. You had to be there. Jason Mackett here. Good morning to you. How are you? You okay? Welcome to the show. Thanks. I know you've been patient in the background there. Thanks a million. Uh, how are you getting on? Yeah, all good. All good. Just been a busy year um, with the World Cup. I'm obviously out in Qatar at the minute. I don't know if you know. I'm out in Qatar, so I've been there. I've been here for a while, to be honest. I just didn't go home. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've just been mad busy with everything here, like Premier League, FA Cup, League Cup. Um, Champions League and then we did the Europa League last night in fact we've done the conference league we've done West Ham last night so yeah it's just it's all busy and obviously winding up now to, to the summer then we've got the Women's World Cup then we've got the Premier League starts again then the Asian Cup in January, February so it's just really busy here It's endless yeah it's probably not a bad way to be your list is unbelievable so we've got about 20-25 minutes and I want to get into it it's an incredible list it's possibly as good a list I think as we've as we it is it's the best list we've had let's just call it Um, we're going to kick things off Paul McGrath 1994 Italy World Cup talk to us a little bit about yourself almost maybe if you will just in the lead into it the context of yourself you're still at Bolton at that stage if I'm right yeah that's right um yeah, we, we changed manager at Bolton. Bruce Rioch had come in for Phil Neal, who, who signed me. Um, I'd, I'd been there probably about phew, five months, and then obviously Bruce comes in, and then he, he changes it up. Um, you know, he, he throws a bit of the the youth into the into the team, and um, myself, Alan Stubbs, uh, he brought in Alan Thompson, and we, we we kind of went on a really good few cup runs and stuff. So we kind of made our, a bit of a name for ourselves, but we we quickly. Um, yeah, we quickly started getting some attention. And from for me, it was international attention. So I got asked to play for England, turned them down. And then obviously, you know, Jack then asked me to play for, for Ireland. And the, the Ireland had already qualified for the World Cup. Um, so we we had a couple of warm-up games. There was one in Germany, I remember, in Hanover. And I think we won 2 nil. Gary Kelly scored. And I think Jack had kind of made his mind up then that he was going to take myself, Phil Bab and Gary Kelly to, to the World Cup uh, mm. in the June. So, um, so obviously I was, I was delighted, but I didn't expect at all, you know, to feature in any of the games. I was still wet behind the ears. I was, I was still, you know, learning my trade really at Bolton. So to be thrust into international football, never mind the World Cup was one thing. So I, I just took it all in my stride, to be honest. So I ended up on the plane and before I know it, I'm landing in, um, I'm landing in New York with the squad. You like, even despite all that, would have come within a whisker of starting that game would you like Ray Houghton obviously is back from the dead you replace him in the game things could have been very different yeah I never you know I never went there with expectations of playing it was kind of I always felt I was going to be back up and, and I just wanted to enjoy the experience I mean it was a lot more relaxed back then you know we, we weren't getting monitored and we didn't have watches on or the body packs or mm-hmm. that they were today and you know diets were <laughs> Diet wasn't really a thing. So there was very much a feel good factor. And, and the fact that, you know, I think a country when Ireland go, the expectations is, is kind of just to get out the group is, is success for us. So, you know, it, it was very much a, a relaxed camp. I, th- I think there was obviously some nailed on starters. You know, you look at Packy nailed on, um, and then Andy, uh, Steve Staunton, Dennis Irwin. Um, there was a, obviously one or two positions that were probably up for grabs because of injuries and stuff, but I never felt that I was always in contention to, to take over from Ray Houghton or I was going to push him for a place. But, you know, one thing I did I did remember is I adapted really well to the heat. I mean, it was so hot out there um, in June in New York and in Florida that I, I kind of, I was really fit. I was a really fit player. There was box-to-box midfield. Jack Seamy, obviously, on the right. I played a few games, the warm-up games on the right. But I was very, very fit and I adapted really well to the weather. So I don't know I don't know whether Jack's seen something in training um, where he thought, I'm going to use him at some point. But obviously, that's that's how it happened um, come the first game against Italy. I was used for about 
I don't know, about 25, 28 minutes or something. She's getting the chance to play at the Giant Stadium as well, Jason. I mean, such a historic venue as well. It must have been pretty special. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's funny, really, because when, when, when you're playing a game and you're picked, you have a routine and you're in your own world. I mean, I've you know I've been lucky enough to play around the world in some of the, the best stadiums in, in all different countries. And to be honest, I couldn't tell you a great deal about the experience. I could tell you something that maybe that happened in the game or maybe I know, something stuck in my mind. But when you're playing, you're very much focused on yourself and the moment and the 90 minutes and what you want to do and how you want to do it, your preparation, your eating and stuff. When you're not picked to play and you don't think you're going to play any part, mm. not that you're kind of there on holiday, but you kind of absorb it a lot more. Like, I remember, you know, coming out the hotel, getting on the bus, the music that we used to play, you know, Mick, Mick Byrne, you know, big sing song on the bus. Um, and then it went quite quiet as we went into the stadium. I remember the dressing room being massive. Like, the, the thing about America at the time, everything was bigger. And so everything just felt massive to me. So I went, it was my birthday as well. So, you know, I, I was enjoying like people saying happy birthday and getting cards and, you know, speaking to people. My family were there. So I was very, very relaxed. Um, and then I remember going out on the pitch and looking up and it just went up and up and up. <laughs> and it was just like <laughs> filling up with people. And, I, you know, I'd, I'd come from Berry away at Bolton. I'm thinking, what is going on here? <laughs> same, this same. Is like, <laughs> yeah, it's mental. It's mental. And then, you know, that you, you do the team talk. Jack, you know, done his team talk. The players were, were ready and prepared. It was so hot. And then we go out and play. And then I'm on the bench. And then I remember, I remember Jack. I was, I was telling Richard Keys yesterday because um, the weather is is so hot. I remember him Jack saying to me, "Go and warm up." And I remember thinking. <laughs> It's 120 <laughs> degrees in the stadium. I, I couldn't get any hotter. It's like, <laughs> I'm like, Jack, throw me on, I'm ready. And what? then um, it was that moment. It kind of dawns on you. Um, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm going on here. I'm, I'm going on. And it's like Maldini, Baresi. I'm watching these fellas on Gazetta Football on Channel 4. Like, you know, six weeks earlier, I'm watching Channel 4 on a Saturday morning with James Richardson. And these are all becoming my heroes, really. I mean, Maldini, Baresi, Baggio, Signori, Donadoni, Costa Cerza. I mean, the names just roll off your tongue. Really? It's like, they're there. Yeah. They're there. I remember I remember being in the tunnel with them, thinking, oh my God, these are like film stars. These fellas, look at them. They're like, they were all tanned. <laughs> like, they were a bit of, because it was hot, they were like, a, a, they had a glow because they were sweating. Maldini had his long hair, Donadoni. It was like, but Aze looked like a Roman gladiator, all the scars on his face, and he's like hard looking. Baggio was like poster boy. And, I, and like we, we were basically like the dog and duck, to be honest. It was like compared to the Italians, it, you know, there was no comparison. But, so, for all, but for all that, Jason, it was uh, the man in the Irish number five shirt that stole the show. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, I remember obviously I watched, you know, a good hour of the game and. The thing that stood out is is, is after the game and, and maybe a couple of years later, you don't appreciate probably the performance at the time. Or well, you do, but you don't put it into great context. It's when you know Paul's background. You know, I knew it mm. and I knew there was problems and I knew, you know, he had his struggles. But being young and being in my own world, you don't take on board the enormity of, of the struggles for someone as an individual. Mm. And it's only when you... You, you go later on in your career and you realise, you know, to go through that, but then perform and then perform at that level. It, it's just, you, you've got to just put it into context. And, you know, some of the things he was doing, and I remember Babsy obviously played alongside him because Kev, Kev had got injured, Kevin Moran got injured. So Babsy had got his, his chance. And I was really worried for Babsy, but it was quite evident that the two of them struck up a really good partnership. And Paul... And Paul looked after Phil as well. So it was not only his performance, it was the fact that Phil played so well off Paul looking after him and directing him and showing him basically where to be and, and just, you know, directing traffic. And, you know, after the game, um, it was one of the moments which wasn't captured. I mean, the the um, the Pele, Bobby Moore photograph, you know, the famous photograph where they swap mm. shirts. 
um, there was a moment Baresi and Paul come together and it was that moment. And I remember shaking hands with everyone and watching because it was Baresi and he comes up to Paul and they exchange words and they hug each other. And it was that Bobby Moore Pele moment for me. And I've got it in my head. I've always had it in my head, this image. And um, yeah, it was, you know, Baresi approached Paul. It wasn't the other way around. And it was just, I've watched it back a few times and that performance from a centre half under them conditions and the, the stresses he was going through in his own in his own life was just phenomenal. Yeah. Absolutely phenomenal. A phenomenal player and we we sometimes think, oh, we think about it through green tinted lenses. You had Gary Lineker on Twitter the other week saying uh, that he was, I can't remember, was it the best centre, one of the best centre. Marshall Halland. Yeah, yeah, Marshall yeah. Halland, yeah. yeah, incredible. Um, yeah. Right, we, we're going to move on. We're moving to uh, forward a few years. We're moving to Lansdowne Road. Needless to say, everybody expected this to be on the list. It's Ireland-Holland. It's uh, World Cup 2002 qualifier. Um, Holland are having a few struggles. They needed the win to stay alive. Uh, Ireland hadn't lost under Mick at Lansdowne Road. Uh, you want to talk about Roy Keane here. We might touch on you a little bit as well, but you want to talk about Roy. Yeah, it kind of was... The to set it up, it was kind of the perfect storm for us as a qualification. I mean, we... You know, we'd, get, we'd entered the, the qualifiers with Portugal and Holland in the group and we were never expected to get out, to be honest. Um, you know, two powerhouses. Um, but Mick had, obviously, it evolved, the squad had evolved and there was obviously the younger players had come in, but they were well settled when we started the campaign in 2000. You know, a lot of them had had the debuts, a lot of them were used to Mick. Um, things had changed from, from the Jack era. You know, myself, Roy, Phil, um, although Phil was in and out under Mick, Gary... You know, we were becoming more and more the, the senior pros and taking over from the likes of Ray and Ronnie and um, Andy Townsend and stuff. Um, yeah, so, you know, the campaign started well, although we... See, this is where the seeds are set, you see. This is where it leads up to why he, you know, through that campaign was immense. But why that game kind of... Why I picked Roy was obviously we went to Holland in the first game. Everyone, again, not expecting us to get anything. But then we... We go 2-0 up um, and then we end up 2-2 being pegged back and we're all congratulating each other and, and basically celebrating in the dressing room afterwards. And it, in, in its own right, it's a fantastic achievement. You know, I don't want to take anything away from that night because it was. But one person who didn't celebrate and was quick to tell us to stop was was Roy. And, you know, where, he, where we felt, you know, we've achieved something great, to him, it was two points dropped. It wasn't the fact it was Holland and it wasn't the fact that we went away and we got a draw. We, we dropped two points for being 2-0 up and everyone kind of took a step back and it, it took the edge off the celebration, but it also planted the seed that we shouldn't fear anyone in this group. You know, we're, we're here on merit. You know, we're a very, very good team. We've got a chance and our captain is telling us that. So, you know, we went through the campaign, a couple of draws against Portugal, I think, and, you know, we, we then, we win the easier games which then sets up the game in, in Lansdowne Road. You know, Mick being very old school in his, in his management in the sense of they use everything that they need to motivate you, which obviously was Van Gaal's interviews and the, and the Dutch's arrogance was mentioned. You know, it was a matter of how many goals the Dutch were going to score that day. And, I mean, you look down the team sheet <laughs> and it was one to like kind of, well, you know, how are we going to get anything out of this today? It was full of like stars. So, you know, the, the game, we prepped we prepped most of the week um, and then we kick off. England played as well that day. So there was a lot of football, everyone with the eye. The world was watching. It's kind of a, a day out for everyone in the pubs, wasn't it, to go and watch like a double header, mm. uh, England, Ireland, and, you know, see Ireland get beat, basically. And the day start, the game started. Um, and then again, the tone was set. You know, Roy smashes over Mars. Do you and, talk and about everyone. that in advance, Jason? Like that was, you know, it was like the ball was there to be won, and he and he, it's maybe the most famous tackle in Irish sport of all time. But he he leaves something on him, obviously, and it kicks off a little bit afterwards, which I'd totally forgotten about. There's a little bit of a melee afterwards. To Ian Hart tries to catch Zenden maybe a little bit. Clivert levels Kilban, who comes off uh, laughing away. I texted about him last night. He said, uh, "I said, what were you saying to him that you were that you walked away laughing?" And it was an F word and uh, something else or whatever. Like was so there was an edge there. That was all within the first sort of couple of minutes. Was that something he spoke about beforehand, or did the tackle kind of go, "Oh, we're here"? Yeah, yeah. It, it kind of the tackle. 
I remember it vividly. I don't remember much of the other stuff you just mentioned there, but the tackle vividly because you start the game, there's a lot of nerves. And listen, we're at home, you know, mm. so the crowd, I mean, it was one of my favourite places to play Lansdowne because just the, the the emotion, the crowd, the noise, the, you know, what the Irish fans bring. You know, they love sport, don't they? But the, the Irish fans, they, they come and they watch and they... But they all, always give us a chance. It was no matter who we played, the crowd always felt we had a chance. So, you know, you go out there with, with now a bit of expectation. It's like in the dressing room, it's like, right, let's see what we've got and let's see if we if we could get something where you go out and the crowd's basically expecting you to get something. It's not if, it's, you know, you've got to get something. So, you know, you're a bit nervous. The, the national anthems play, it was, it was a, you know, it hadn't gone dark, it was bright. And we, we kind of... You know, we were we were just not not maybe overawed with the situation, but it was for some of us it was the biggest game that we've ever played. You know, in the sense of where it was going to take us. I mean, I never played in the qualifiers, so I never had that sense of achievement with the lads in '94. I can tell you when you know with with Iran, the sense of achievement is is phenomenal. It's something I'll never ever forget that feeling in Iran. But that game was obviously going to take us onto that. So, you know, the tackle. The tackle was the was the was the moment. The tackle was the moment where you brush everything off. You you forget about the emotion of the game. You, you're in it now. It, it's like the first punch has landed, and it's it's like it, as much as it knocked over Mars back. I think it I think it spelled out to us, right? Let's roll our sleeves up now. And you know they did battle us for twenty minutes. And, and in all honesty, on another day it could have been two or three. Could have been down. We could have been two or three down. Yeah. But um. But the tackle, you know, was was like we're in it, and then it was game on. And then I remember putting a cross in towards the end of the first half. I think Quinny chested down, and Robbie had a kick. And for me, you remember the Ivan Drago moment where Rocky punches him and he cuts him, and then it's that belief that you can actually hurt them. It was yeah. like it was kind of like that moment yeah. then, and it was like, oh right, we can actually like <laughs> we can make make chances for ourselves. And with Robbie and Quinny, you know, anything can happen. So the, the game. You know, obviously goes on. Gary Kelly then smashes over Mars, gets booked, and then we're in a half time. You know, nil nil. So it's game on. It's the equivalent, I think, of uh, of Neil Armstrong for the rest of his life being asked what it was like to walk on the moon. Do you ever get sick of being asked about the the goal against the Dutch? Is it the question you're most asked of, Jason? Uh, that and the white suits. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, you know. I think whenever I go in the world, you know, you meet anyone. From Ireland, and they, they were at the game. We there must have been three million at that game. That day, <laughs> I, I met every one of them, um, and everyone wants to talk about it because it's it's their memory as well. It's not, you know, when when we do something like these moments now, I love reminiscing because because it's yours, isn't it? It's it, it's your memory of it. it it's my memory is going to be different than yours. I know I played, but you know my memory is different than Kevin Kilban's because we share different emotions and different. We've got different attachments to the situation, so. You know, I love talking about things like that, and I love hearing other people's stories. I mean, this this story obviously evolves into the the Bono and the U two and the Slain, and you know, it's just you know that is one of my biggest regrets. You know, not going up to Slain that night because I thought it was a wind up, but it was actually a true. It was actually true. I was supposed to go on stage, but you know, never mind. But that, that's another story. But you know, as far as this day goes, you know, it was my moments in my career. You know, I had a fantastic career, and I loved every minute of it. But I always think, you know, when you when you put the hard yards in, like like a lot of elite sportsmen do, there is that nice thing to have a moment, just a moment, and and this is my this is my moment. Um, I've just out of the corner of my eye in the studio <laughs> spotted uh, Merlin's Ireland 2002 book with, uh, wow. with the man himself here on the front cover. Um, he wanted to talk about Roy his his. He talks about himself as not been, uh, wasn't a great player, wasn't technically very good. He makes an absolute mug out of Van Bommel in the lead into your goal. Yeah, well, the go the goal comes from a corner, um, which I had to run the I had to run from the right, right over to the left, um, for an in swinger. So I, it was a pretty good corner, to be honest, if I say so myself. <laughs> and the keeper comes and punches, and we obviously pick the ball up, and. The best thing about the goal is the advantage, you know, because Duffer, 
Duffer gets absolutely mullered <laughs> in a tackle. Yeah. And the referee waves play on. Now, you know, that, that was a big advantage to take that free kick. It was a goal scoring opportunity. It was just outside the box. But the, the ball obviously ends up over a fin. And it was a great advantage by the referee. But from me personally, I really, because, because the ball had gone so far back to the halfway line from the clearance, really, I should have been on the right-hand side helping Finn out. I, it should have been me putting the cross in, in all honesty. And I, I, kind of, I kind of ambled back on side and I got caught up in watching, to be honest. I got ball watching. You know, you get told off for that. But I got, I got caught up ball watching. I think because it was on the left as well, on the halfway line, it might have given me the opportunity to track back if, if we'd have lost it. But, you know, Roy does brilliant. Duffer does brilliant. And then Finn, you know, turns back on himself onto his weaker foot, and, which I never understand. And he, he puts this ball in, which, you know, ends up being an in-swinger instead of an out-swinger because he's gone onto his left foot. And then Kev tries to, tries to head it on. Duffer tries to head it on, I think. And n- no one gets a touch. And there's me, back stick unmarked, you know, with a bouncing ball, probably getting asked to do one of the hardest techniques, which is a half volley with a bit of topspin. So, um, yeah, I can't say I've ever done it previously and I don't think I've ever done it since. So, it, yeah, it was it was very much set up to be my moment and, and it drops and Van der Sar, you know, he comes out, makes himself big, but not big enough and it goes in the top corner and, you know, the, the rush of adrenaline and achievement goes through you and it's like, like you know, it, it's, yeah, I think I jumped about 25 foot in the celebration yeah. and then all the lads come over and then Roy ends up at my doorstep and he just like gives me a, a bit of a like, well done, we've still got 20 minutes to go kind of look. Yeah, get on with like, it. Stop <laughs> celebrating, let's get on with it. And uh, I end up going back into position and then we, we, hold, we hold out. But, You've asked me to pick, you know, you've asked me to pick a, a star from the day and I've gone with Roy because, you know, he he was immense through that qualifying campaign and it, it still upsets me today that he missed the World Cup in the circumstances that he did because he was arguably the best midfielder in the world at the time. And you mentioned some names there and that's just Holland. You, you know, you go to the Italians, the English, the you know, there were some top, top Germans, there were some top, top midfielders in the world. But he was in, he was definitely in the top three. And, you know, what he, what he brought to, to the campaign, but what he brought to that day, the tackle, the leadership, you know, what he said at half time, you know, going back out for the second half. And then we were down to 10 men, you know, and it, it was get over yourself after the goal. We've still got 20 minutes to, to see this game out. And we did. I think I went off with cramp, I think, with about five minutes to go. And then, obviously, we, we, we won the game. But, um, but yeah, it was it was some performance by him. But I think everyone was man of the match on that day. Perfect everyone. Perfect. Your, uh, your stickers are, uh, you can't see it uh, where you're looking at us, but you're, uh, you got shinies in the book. We'll send you on a picture of it. Your, um, which okay. Which you were, uh, yeah. you were What's particularly mean? rated. You weren't just a plain old... Uh, <laughs> Glass, a uh, matte sticker. <laughs> you were, you were a shiny. Shiny. I mean, kids you will be made up. You were a shiny. <laughs> yeah. I'll send John a picture of it. It's actually it's a beautiful um, little thing. All these years on, uh, whistle stop tour. The last three, right? So uh, Tiger Woods, the Open, Royal Liverpool, two thousand and six. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm from the Wirral. I, um, you know, I was born there, uh, and I was never, never really a, a, a golf nut. Um, but the, the the Open hadn't been at Royal for thirty nine years, and um, you know, obviously Tiger was in his pop, was in his pomp. I think his dad had just died as well, so there was a lot of right. like, yeah. there was a lot of emphasis on Tiger, and you know, obviously his relationship with his dad. And I, and I was a Tiger fan. I mean, I think everybody he was, wasn't he? I mean, what he'd done for sports, um, you know, for black athletes as well. You know, the game. You know, he was opening up so much to the world, wasn't he? And, and offering so much, but he was unbelievable. I mean the stuff, you know, you go through the you know, you go through his, his C V. Up to then it was it was fantastic. So, you know, going the open being at Royal was literally fifteen minutes from my house. So, you know, I'd, I'd managed to get some tickets. I was friends with a couple of people from Taylor Maid. Um so they, I got invited. So I went I went with with a friend and we went down there and I got a 
I got a text just before I went in into the in, onto the course saying, "Come to the truck, and the Taylor made truck. It's it's down the side of the um, it's down the side of the practice area." Mm. So I was like, "Okay." So me and my friend, we we walk through the crowds, we get in, and then we make our way to the practice area. And as I'm as I'm going in, it was like a small gap, but it, it was like there was like a small fence. There was lots of people on the the outside of the fence, and then there was obviously all the, the coaches and and kind of friends and fam, maybe some family on the inside of the ropes. But there was a small gap to go through to get onto the inside of the ropes. So I was walking through, and I was you know I was getting asked to do some some autographs and some photographs and stuff and, and whatever. So I was kind of in this gap where the players come in and, and start to go to start to practice. So I'm there and I'm t- signing some autographs with people having a bit of a laugh and stuff and I'm talking. The next thing I, I just get a, a excuse me like that. So I, I kind of turn around and um, Steve's there, his caddy, and Tiger's standing behind him. <laughs> and it's it's the Sunday, it's the final day. So he's obviously come to the practice to warm up. So now I'm standing there blocking Tiger Woods going into the <laughs> practice area. So I'm like, I just give him a sorry mate. And um and then walked in and kind of said to him, thanks very much, and walked in. And then just, you know, but what I what I felt was, you know, when someone's got a presence about them, I mean he's tall and he's like, you know, he's he's athletic and he's like he looks the part in his red top. Mm. And um he just had this he just oozed this aura and this personality and charisma. And he walked in like he owned the place. It was like he just stood out. And um, I went and watched him hit a few balls. And then I went into the truck. I went to the truck. And um, and then I watched from the truck, which was down the side of the practice area where they were hitting balls. So he then disperses and he goes, obviously, onto the putting green. And I walk back across. But I walk across the... The, the, the driver that the practice area because no one no one else is there because he's obviously in the last group so we, I walk across and the police had come onto the practice ground to stop people going on there and there's ball spotters who go and pick up all the balls so Tiger hit his own balls they were night balls at the time and he, hit, he had his own balls so people were trying to pick his balls up and identify them so I picked I picked a couple of balls up and one of them was Tiger's and there was a policeman there and I looked at it, and I looked at this policeman, <laughs> and he went, "Go on," and I just put it in my pocket. Class. And, and I you still have it? Walking. Yeah. So I, I got I got one of Tiger Woods' golf balls. That's that class. So I've still got it. I've got a box at home with all stuff in it. And it's in there. That's a and, great. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I I went out, and then I mean I don't know if you lads have been to golf. It's quite a hard watch to golf. Mm. It's you know it it's a lot of walking around. You you, you you've got to be place and, and watch them come through with the golf you can't it's difficult to walk around following someone because the crowd following tiger was just immense but i was with someone who was um she was quite famous herself and she was off the telly and we got dogs abuse to be honest the, the amount of stuff that people were shouting we, we we ended up leaving um and i went home and watched it on the telly i watched the rest of it on the telly but just to see him in the flesh to watch him make golf balls. I mean, it it makes a different noise. I mean, I play golf now. You know, I play golf all the time. He he's a different animal. He, yeah. it, the noise off a golf ball when he hits it is is it's different. It's just different. Yeah, um, well, um, incredible thing to be yeah, out, incred- it, to, to witness him and his pomp. Just a um, yeah, a seriously. So the last two, right? Uh, Gino and Aldum against Barcelona, twenty sixteen. They blitzed him. He's uh, just in the team. Perform a uh, brilliant performance. And Floyd Mayweather against Ricky Hatton. You were in Vegas. Were you 2007? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the fight was built up. You know, Ricky was doing really, really well. Um, again, another bit of a funny story. He was doing really, really well. And he's obviously now earned the right to fight Mayweather. And it was obviously Vegas. Um, but the date fell where my agent rang me and just said, listen, you're off. Do you want to, should we go to Vegas? So I, I watched the fight. So I was like, yeah, fancy it, yeah. So he said, I was friends with Paddy McGuinness at the time. So he, he, he said, should we ask Paddy? So I said, yeah. So he, he rang Paddy and I said, listen, do you fancy Vegas? Ricky Atten fight, we can get tickets. So he goes, I'm in. So we book the flights, we fly to Vegas. Um, we go over, 
we get the tickets, <clears throat> um, we go to fight. Now, the, the thing that that struck me was I get I get we get in the the arena, <clears throat> and in the hotel we got we, we watch the fight. Great seats, great great tickets. Um, Mayweather he basically toyed with Ricky, and you talk about Tiger in his pomp. This was Mayweather now in his pomp, mm. and you know I I've never seen Ricky Atten didn't put a punch on him. He didn't lay a finger on him, and it was it was crazy. He toyed with him for, for round after round after round. And then he obviously wins the fight. And then everyone kind of disperses. And we're, we're kind of hanging around, lingering around, letting the crowd go. And Mayweather comes back out. And he, he kind of gets on the mic and he introduces himself. He goes, I'm Floyd, Floyd Mayweather. Because I don't think anyone expected him to come back out. He comes back out, he goes, I'm Floyd Mayweather. He went, listen, I just want to thank everyone for coming. You know, really appreciate your support all the English fans who have come over, all the fans, all the international fans, you know, you've all come to watch. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And I thought that was a really nice touch. So we were invited to the the party after the fight. So we go and Ricky, because he, he got knocked out, he had to go to hospital. So he turns up late. He's obviously a bit bruised and battered. So he stays about five or 10 minutes. We say hello to him. Um, he then goes. But he says to us, come and, come and see me tomorrow in the hotel. So we go, okay. So we go to his hotel the next day and I remember knocking on his door and he opened his door and do you know what struck me? You could have drawn a line down the middle of his face and this side of his face was basically out here mm. and this side, was there was not a mark on it. It was it was just remarkable. It was either this side of that or this side of that, whatever it was, mm. but it was his lead inside. So... Obviously, you leave with one side, and Mayweather just jabbed this side of his face to a pulp, basically, and then obviously knocked him out, and he's obviously taken the thing. So we get in his room, and he says to me, um, and Joe was in there, Joe Calzaghi. So he goes, um, listen, um, we've got to do Sports Personality of the Year, and we're going to do it ringside. We've got about like 20 seats set up, like a bit of an audience, and they're going to come live to Vegas. Do you want to, do you want to come and sit with us? So, so I'm like, yeah, all right, yeah. And he's like, yeah. So we go down and we're sitting in these seats. And next thing, it's like, we're live in Las Vegas. Sports personality of the year. Ricky, obviously, it didn't go your way last night. And then it's like, yeah. And then Joe goes on and speaks. And then, um, and then afterwards, we just go for a few pints. And we're all talking away. And then um, I get a text off, um, off a woman who looks after the Spice Girls saying... Um, Spice Girls are in Mandolin Bay tonight. Um, you know, they've heard you in town. Do you want to come and watch? So I, I was like to the lads, do you want to go and watch the Spice Girls tonight? <laughs> and they were like, yeah, let's go to Spice Girls. So we end up watching the Spice Girls. Melanie got us a couple of tickets and we end up um, we end up about the third row back waving to the Spice Girls in Mandalay Bay. So it was a pretty eventful trip, to be honest. <laughs> That's amazing. Sometimes we joke about these things as being like a Forrest Gump list, but uh, yours definitely yeah. is that, and even more so having heard that last story. I miss said uh, when Alden was 16, 19, of course, uh, was that one. But look, we're out of time. It's an incredible list. Oh. You've delivered it brilliantly. Okay. We really enjoyed your company over the last uh, half hour. Look after yourself. Thanks very much. Really enjoyed it, reminiscent. Brilliant, thanks. Love that. We'll send you on a picture of that shiny as well. It's there's a nice little description of you in there as well. That uh, yeah, I'll go even higher with the boys at home. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. boys. Thanks, thanks Jason. Much, Come on, thanks, thank you, Take it easy. Well done. Hello. That's you had to be there. It's so unexpected. It's one of those you had to be there moments. You had to be there. It subsequently genuinely did change everything about my life. I had to be there. All right, quarter to ten on Monday's show. It'll be Jaron Shane, the Gillette Labs performance rankings, Ned Manua. We'll look back in the weekend's football, Anthony Moyles in the GEA. Rory Best will look back on the weekend's uh, rugby as well as Alan Quinlan, and we'll have plenty more as well besides. But right now, John Giles with Nathan on last night's show. Have a wonderful weekend. All delighted to be joined by John Giles. How are you keeping, John? Okay, Nathan. Uh, there's been a, a lot going on this week. A couple of Champions League semi-finals, and for many yeah. people, the final uh, within there of Real Madrid and Manchester City uh, won all over in Spain on Tuesday night. What did you make of the City performance? I thought it was quite good, Nathan. You know, the, the Real Madrid are a very, very good team, great manager and Ancelotti, uh, and I thought they responded well. Uh, I thought the, the, the Bruyne was the Bruyne was very good. Sometimes I think he's 
gets a bit cranky with his teammates and that, but he, he, he performed well, really well against Madrid, took his goal really well. So it was a top class match, as you know, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. But I'd say City should be favourites now going back to, uh, going back to Manchester. De Bruyne has had an interesting season in that the World Cup was a real struggle for him with Belgium, didn't seem happy on the pitch or off the pitch there. And there's definitely been more of an inconsistency to his performances for Manchester City. But when you look back on the biggest games of the season, Real Madrid on Tuesday night, the match against Arsenal, Liverpool, both games against Arsenal, yeah. in fact, in the Premier League, the 6-3 against Manchester United earlier in the season, like generally De Bruyne has stepped up when it's mattered. Yeah, he's that type of player, uh, Nathan. Obviously, he's a very, very talented lad. But, uh, you know, if you go back to the World Cup, he did a piece in the paper where he, he said, I can't do it on my own. I need some help from the players. You know, that's not good, especially mm. to the players around him. Uh, I think uh, Guardiola had a go at him not so long ago. Nathan. I think he left him out in a couple of matches. and uh, he, I think he booked up since then. Because when he when he does play, he, I mean, and play at his best, he's really, really top-notch. Uh, and I think in recent times he's been playing very, very, very well. But I think Guardiola had a goal at him. I think he, he you know, he, I think he's, he's a moody type of individual uh, mm. who demands a lot of people around him, you know, uh, which is okay as long as he's doing it himself. Um, but he's, he, he has stepped up in, in recent matches, there's no doubt. The fact that it is the biggest matches is massive for Manchester City that they can rely on him to deliver on the big occasion. Is there a bit that you know, he's 31 now, he's going to be 32 during the summer, that maybe it's just he's struggling for a bit of motivation for the run-of-the-mill, week-in, week-out league games? Yeah, well, it shouldn't be. Nathan. You know, like when you're a pro like he is, it's like if, if you do that, you're letting your, your teammates down. Mm. You know, if he's not going to play well, it, well that, it involves everybody else in the team. Because he's in a position in the middle of the field, as we know, where you expect him to do it. You know he can do it. And if he's, if he's I, I would doubt that. It's just, he's a moody type of individual anyway. I think he needs a bit of handling. Uh, but very, very, very talented. And I think Guardiola, you know, saw that in him and said, look, unless you get, out, get, get going again, uh, you'll be out or you'll be gone. One, whatever else he has to say to him. Mm. But in recent times, in the big matches, he has played well, and I thought he played well the other night. And, and an excellent, obviously, an excellent goal that he did score. What did you make of how it worked out in midfield? We obviously have such high standards for Luka Modric, and you know, for a large part of the games, again, he showed that usual control. How did Manchester City uh, compare to that Real Madrid midfield? Um, I think in the second half they did. You know, it was the first time I've seen Modric maybe getting tired. Nathan in the second half, mm. you know he wasn't uh, he wasn't dominating the game. Like in the first half, I thought um, Madrid were on top. Second half, City definitely got on top, and we didn't see uh, uh, Modric. That's unlike him, Nathan. I think he took him off a little bit early as well. You know, maybe maybe the years are catching up on him. But uh, you know, in City's City's midfield, like he would, I think, at his best, dominate the middle of the field. Yeah, you know, uh, I think he's, he's had, he's had a bit of an injury as well over the last. Things. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, Nathan. I was, going, I was just going to say, Modric's had a bit of an injury as well over the last couple of weeks. So maybe, as you say, there was that bit actually a fatigue in the second half. Yeah, I think so because he's more. He's the type of player that can dominate the game. City don't have a, have a player that can dominate mm. the game. They've got Rodri and you got Gundogan. Uh, you know, De Bruyne does it in flashes. He's not—he's not, he's not a, a player that does it all the time. And but he's very, very effective when he's at his best. But they wouldn't have—they wouldn't have a Modric. So I—I I was disappointed in Modric because he's—he's a great player, as we know. But he didn't really do it uh, against City the other night. Manchester City have had so many sporting catastrophes in the Champions League over the last four or five seasons where you felt this was the year they were going to do it and suddenly there'd be a concession of two or three quick goals and they'd find themselves out of the competition. When you look at the performance on Tuesday and heading into the second leg next Wednesday at the Etihad, does this City team look better than what's gone before over the last three or four years to, to deal with whatever Madrid throw at them? I think so. I mean, if you go back to last year, I mean, they look like they had the game tied up. Mm. You know, Madrid are very, very good at that. I mean, Nancelotti's a, a great manager and great players. 
in there. They still, well, it's not over yet, Nathan. It's probably the best chance of, of doing it now. It looks like on paper it's the hard one, the real hard one is away from home. And now they're at home. Are they going to use that? Use the advantage of that? I, I think they will, but that's, uh, you know, but I, I, I wouldn't, well, I don't put any money on it anyway, but I wouldn't be surprised at anything that Madrid do. Now, I'm not trying to work it out. I'm tr- what, what I'm saying is I think City will do it. Yeah. Uh, but I, I certainly wouldn't, I don't think anybody would write uh, Madrid off by any means. Ever since Pep Guardiola... Really doing it, but I think City are a situation now. But if, unless, unless Pep does something... <laughs> Totally different again. Well, you that, know, that's he, what I was he, going to ask you. That everyone still goes back know, to the Champions League know. final and leaving Rodri out. It does seem when you look at the team that lined out the last night, which was the same team that started against Arsenal, that actually yeah. he's, he's keeping it incredibly straightforward. I, I, well, I think so. No, I think that's the way it should be. I mean, if we go back to the Chelsea match in the final a couple of years ago, Nathan, he was all over the place. He, he, he played without a midfield, you know, mm. from nowhere. I mean, he's, he is inclined to do that, but in recent times, I, I think he's picked his best team uh, for these particular matches. And certainly, I think he picked his best team the other night. There was no messing about with it, you know, playing too many forward or that. They, they, were, they were good. The match was good. Madrid started very well, but, but City played well, and, and, and a good goal got them back into it, which should give them, uh, you know, back at home. Unless he does something unusual again, and at the moment he's not doing that type of thing. They won again in the Premier League at the weekend. Uh, tight enough game for the last few minutes against Leeds, a two-one victory. Uh, you were on last week talking about Sam Allardyce, and I think it's fair to say you weren't having him uh, and the impact he could make. Was there any signs in the fact that Leeds stuck in the game that you know they they made for a nervous finale that over the next three games that they can? somehow get the results that will squeeze them out of the champ- uh, the relegation spots? I didn't see it, Nathan, to be honest. I didn't see that against uh, 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 City right. at all. I mean, the, uh, we saw Haaland in recent times, and he, he, could, he could have had a heart, hat-trick in the first half. Mm. So there wasn't, I don't think there was any great pick-up from Allardyce for it, uh, uh, against City. You know, City didn't take their chances. I mean, I, I, I tell you what I think's happened at least. Leeds under Bielsa, I know it's going back a bit, was concentrating on attacking, 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 attacking. And obviously, if you're attacking in a fair amount, you don't have to defend so much. Cause Leeds were never good at, under Bielsa defending, but they were very, very good going forward, and they, they won their fair share of matches doing that. But if you look at Sam, Sam did, as I expected him to, most people expect him to do, was to set out to defend. I mean, they hardly got a kick on a kick of kick of the ball in the first half, and then Haaland is missing chances. So, I, I think he got I think he got away with it. I think Haaland has been taking him, as we know, uh, and uh, I think he got a lucky break. He, there was big controversy over the penalty incident, mm. uh, which I think he was right to go mad over that. I mean, Haaland is is the penalty taker, and because Gundogan and they're winning two 0 at that stage, uh, Nathan three three finishes them off. Uh, totally, uh, but because Gundogan was on a hat trick, uh, you know, Haaland said, "Take it." You, like you don't do that, Nathan. If you've got a penalty taker, he's a penalty taker, and he should be. Whether they're winning six nil or losing six nil, he takes the penalties. You know, that's my that's my take on it. Because Gundogan finished up missing the blooming thing, and then 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 in football, as you never know what's going to happen, uh, Leeds score and make it two one. It's all nervy now. I never believed in in, in it, Nathan. I got into a bit of trouble myself at Leeds with the crowd. We were playing in a European Cup match one night and we were winning 6-0. And Albert Albert Johansson was on a hat-trick. And uh, the crowd was shouting for Albert to take the penalty. And I said, no, I'm the penalty taker. You know, I take them in the good days, I take them in the bad days. Yeah. (laughs) I don't think the crowd ever forgave me. (laughs) Did you you score the penalty? I did, yeah. Yeah, That's all right then. But but it didn't... (laughs) I, I mean, from then on, I, I never, not that I care too much, but I never got in the first three of the player of the year. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but the Albert love was gone. Albert, you know, the love Albert was, the was, was, was a scar, gone. star with the, with the crowd, which yeah. is fair enough. But I just never believed in it. You know, if, if, if it's a penalty, it's a penalty. You're the penalty taker. You, t- you take it, not on the good. You do it on the good days and the bad days. 
And I think that's why Pep was going mad the other day. Although I think he should have established stronger than he has done, that nobody takes the penalties unless the penalty taker has taken them. Mm. You know, he went mad afterwards about, about, about what happened. But, but I think it should have been established from day one as a penalty taker, uh, Nathan, that no matter what the score is, the penalty taker takes it. I, I did. A, I made a mistake one time myself in, in, in a situation like that. It was an international match, and uh, I think it was against Turkey. And they were not a. They were a fair team, but we went three up at half before half time, and Ray Tracy took, scored two, and we got a penalty just after half time, and I let Ray take the penalty. Shouldn't have done, and he missed it, and they scored two, Nathan. Turkey. And why did and you let why on. did you let him take it? Hmm? Why did you let him take it? Because he's on a hat trick. Yeah. It was stupid. I shouldn't I never didn't do it myself at a club level and I let Ray do it because to be honest, I did think we were we were, we were home and dry. Because they were terrible in the first half, Turkey. And just after half time this was to make a four nil that Ray Tracer let him and it, Ray missed it. And they went on and scored two goals and we hung on. I was stupid. It was my fault. Don't say I'm surprised that you. I didn't do it. I didn't do it at club level. When I was taking penalties myself, at least I wouldn't let anybody else take them. <laughs> I went, got soft that night. To play. <laughs> never <laughs> again. Never <laughs> again. Never again. I shouldn't have done it in the first. I, did, I didn't get on to Ray or anything. It was my own fault. I shouldn't have, it shouldn't have happened. I did honestly think I was home and dry. But I was experienced enough at that stage to know that you're never home and dry until the whistle goes. And that, that happened last week. Pep went mad. But I think Pep should have established it more, much stronger than he did for the penalty taker. It was Haaland that gave the penalty ball to, to, to Dundigan, Gundigan uh, for his hat-trick. And it did look like it was all over. But it never is. Mm. Like, you, have to just, you have to just learn from it. I learned from it early on with Albert Hansen, but, but it didn't do me any favours with the crowd. I didn't care about that, to be quite honest. Yeah. Well, but it's very important. It's are, you so sure, important are you sure it didn't you know, affect you when you but, were thinking about the Ray Tracy thing? You're like, I want the Irish fans to, to love me. I saw what happened with Leeds, didn't finish in the top three of the player of the year. And <laughs> is that going to happen with the Irish supporters? I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I did let Ray take the penalty. Yeah. You know, if Albert Johansson, I said, no, he's not taking it. So yeah. I, I changed my mind on that one. I should never, <laughs> never have done. And it, was, it proved that. Ideally, last week, if you're looking for it, Gundogan misses the penalty, and they go and score, and now they're, now they're hanging on. You know, because you're assuming, but if you're the penalty taker, you're the penalty taker. And uh, It was strange, all right, because City have had so many problems with penalties over recent seasons. Um, if Aguero wasn't on the pitch as to who was going to take them, and they've missed an enormous amount of penalties, it almost felt, watching it, that Haaland was trying to be something that he's not, that he was trying to look like the ultimate team player and not this selfish goal scorer that he needs to be and has been better than we've ever seen in the Premier League before, that he has his 35 goals, he's broken that record, he has his 51 goals in all competitions, he's over the half century, that now he almost needs to be a bit more generous to his teammates when it's really not the time of the season to become that no, guy. Uh, yeah, I, I, don't think, I don't think he was th thinking that deeply about it, Nathan. To be honest now, but when, when Gundogan was taken... Take the penalty. Mm. I, I I didn't in, in my head think. Well, it was so far in front. You know, this was really to finish it off. But it, it just proved to me again: it's never over till it's over. You know, I, I think what happened with uh, with with Hall, uh, Hallam is he thought it was over mm. as well. And 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 when the penalty before the penalty was out, I didn't see Pep jumping up to say, no, he's not to do it. He jumped up after he missed it, <laughs> you know, because I thought he would, if, I didn't think it would matter too much. I thought he would score, but I didn't think it would matter that much. But that happens in football. He misses it, and then Leeds go down and score out of the blue. Now you're in, now you're in trouble. Now it's literally before the end, which it was. Yeah. So, But it should never happen in the first place. I mean, I made the mistake doing it with Ray Tracy. Shouldn't have done it. And I nearly paid the price. We, we finished up winning 3-2. And did, but, uh, did Ray thank you? No. <laughs> <laughs> he missed it. And he never got his hat-trick? He didn't get his hat-trick, no. 
No. No. They can't. Now, I, 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 I went unprofessional on it. I, I mean, at Leeds, I wouldn't let it happen. Yeah. But I really did think we were winning 3 0. I thought it was no problem. And as I should have learned in football, you, it's, it's never over till it's over, yeah. Nathan. No matter what the score may be. I mean, in the match last week, I, City were killing Leeds. They were killing Leeds. And this was a, a hat trick. Uh, OCB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition available now. Off the ball daily.